And we should probably be live now. <laughs> All right, so Derek, I'm going to sound like a rude jerk, but Derek, go um, turn off your video for now until we do um, in a little bit. Yeah, look at that. Great. All right, so hey, everyone. Welcome to being a bit punctual or too early. Wait, too punctual early. I'm combining all words into completely non-words. Um, we're going to talk about more. Nice job. Minutes. Thanks. I'm a, I'm a professional. That, that's also not true. Um, look, let's wave to people. Who's uh, So while, while everyone's uh, starting to log in, tell us what you're drinking and where you are logged in from down there in the comments section of the uh, the Facebook stream. Hey, we've got, got Austin people logging in already early. We're all ready for all of you. Uh, it's very exciting. Um, yeah, I'm doing a terrible job at this. All right, so Chris, we did this for our second or for our first virtual nerd nightathon. I'm gonna do this again. I'm gonna put you on the spot right now. Yeah, this is my least favorite part of the event. Yes, that's why we're getting out of the way before the official start time. Cheers. You know, we have eight presentations over the next four hours. I'm going to tell you the topic of each presentation, and you're going to give me a one-word response to what you... Oh, I, I should have prepared for this, given that this is the same game that we played last Indeed. time. But once right, again, so this I is say, going to be a surprise. If I say syphilis, public health propaganda, what do you say? <laughs> well, <laughs> I can't without blushing well the, the, there's a funny story there <laughs> definitely not a one-word story uh, uh i i think we'll make an exception what's the story <laughs> about syphilis public health propaganda so one time i i tested positive for syphilis and it, it turns out it was a false positive um it was a very traumatic day <laughs> but all all good all good <laughs> what uh, what 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 made you go back a second time to dispel the first false positive test. So it turns out, uh, you may not know this, but having syphilis is very bad. <laughs> and you, do not, you, do not, you don't want that. You don't want that to be part of your world and you don't want that to be like on your record. It like triggers like a whole series of health department things. Um, but it turns yes. out that I, 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 it was a false positive. Uh, and so, you know, the good folks at at uh, at at LabCorp or something, uh, you know, it, things things didn't go quite as well as hoped there. Great, I'm happy for you. All right, with that, let's not eat into uh to Lindsay's time. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, welcome to the official second ever Nerd Night Virtual Nerdathon. Yay! Um, Coming up in just a couple of seconds, we are going to have Dr. Lindsey Grove talking about syphilis and <laughs> <laughs> propaganda. Um, so what I ask for everyone, so first, everyone um, from not St. Petersburg, turn off your webcams now so we can conserve bandwidth for everyone else, and we will see you all online at a later moment. For everyone logged in on Facebook, hi, my name's Matt, that's Chris. Um, Enjoy yourself today, please. Uh, we encourage you to drink along um, the entire evening because you know that's what happens in Nerd Night. Be there and be square. Nerd Night's like Discovery Channel with beer. Uh, drinking and thinking. There are lots of ways to incorporate drinking into your night. Normally we do this face to face and we would cheers you. So let's do a virtual cheers toast. Um, everyone, cheers to drinking something delicious. Hold on a second, let me drink. I'm also sorry that I disappeared and you had a weird beer talking to you just a second ago. Okay, so with that, I'm going to get out of the way. We've got the first of eight presentations coming up right now. Um, we've got a whole bunch of the St. Peter, uh, Nerd Night St. Pete uh, co-bosses logged in. They're going to introduce our presenter. They might plug something else. So I'm turning my thing off. St. Pete, take it away. Thanks so much. It's so great to be here. My name is Journey. I am one of the Nerd Night St. Pete Bosses, and I uh, organize Nerd Night in St. Pete with my good pals and co-bosses Brandy and Karen, um, and super fan Scott, who's here. So, um, 
this is uh, our first St. Pete Nerd Night that is virtual because we are social, social distancing, um, which is an, actually a really good excuse to drink alone. So cheers. <laughs> Um, so like I said, this is our first time doing this, so please be patient. I really hope this goes better than my virtual, uh, Passover Seder, because if not, you will see me ugly cry at the end. I hope I'm not alone there. Um, but without further ado, I am going to introduce our wonderful presenter, so let's see, ready? Lindsay Grove. She has a bunch of letters next to her name. Uh, she is also a super cool lady. And she is a sex education researcher working at the University of S South Florida, St. Petersburg as a visiting instructor and program coordinator for the health sciences degree. She is also the president of the League of Women Voters in St. Pete. Woohoo! I love the League. They also have the best reusable straws, as you know. Um, anyway, so blah, 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 League of Women Voters, St. Pete. Uh, she's also the co-host of the public health podcast, Viral, which you should totally watch. Well, listen to. Sorry, I started at five. Just you know, it's, it's okay. <laughs> I even like I even wore swag today too. See, yes. you should totally listen to it for obvious reasons. Um. So yeah. So also at the same time this is all going on, I just want to point out that everybody is texting me, talking about being about seeing me online. So it's a lot going on right now at my place, even though I'm totally alone. Anyway, so mom, dad, shh. <laughs> anyway, so uh, Dr. Grove co-chairs the Empowering Pinellas Youth Collaborative, a community-driven initiative that supports comprehensive sex education in Pinellas schools. So I would love to welcome Dr. Lindsay Grove. Thank you, thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to share my screen. Let's hope that you know you don't see any of my porn that's up there. Um, all right. So, well, I guess everyone can see that. Um, there we go. Okay, cool. So today we're going to talk about public health, which I know no one knows anything about and has not heard anything on the news about recently. So uh, please get excited for a topic that, you know, is not a part of the everyday news cycle. <laughs> um, and I promise we are definitely going to talk about uh, COVID-19. But before that, as Journey made, you know, very much apparent, I really like talking about sexual health. Um, and yeah, so wait, can you guys see my like presentation screen or the actual slideshow? We can see both. Can you hear me? We've got the view where you can see what's coming up next. So if you hit slideshow again, you'll be good. Okay. All right, so let's, you know what? I'm just gonna do it like this because it just makes sense in my head. Okay. Yeah, totally fine. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, we're gonna talk about public health and propaganda today um, as uh, noted in the uh, intro, but I really wanted to show you all some really great, uh, just awesome vintage World War II posters. And I promise they are absolutely related to uh, what we're gonna talk about today. And they're actually even still related to COVID, which is, I think, kind of interesting. But these are great uh, just because there's some really interesting cultural context around them. Um, <laughs> 
I'm sure all of us are looking at these and thinking, wow, what great advice. Um, you know, when I'm going out, uh, maybe I am judging a woman whether or not, you know, based on whether or not she looks like a bag of trouble. And, you know, cause clearly women are out wearing uh, clothing that would indicate whether or not they have syphilis and gonorrhea. Um, and you can also see on the other one, you know, she may look clean, but again, you know, for the women that can actually hide the fact that they have syphilis, they may still look clean and they still may get you in the end. So uh, not great, right? And there's a ton of, of posters like these. I mean, you can Google search, which is so much fun. And, you know, if for some reason somebody's looking at your uh, browsing history, I'm sure that would make for a really great conversation. Um, but there's a ton of, of, of these vintage posters. And I just think they're amazing because they are such a great commentary on the time um, around sexism and around, um, you know, how we, at least like how public health and, you know, the medical community, as well as the military uh, sort of decided to mix it up and make these amazing posters. And I know that it's like a shocker for everybody, but you know, it really wasn't these amazing posters that changed people's behavior. Um, it was really the, you know, mass production of condoms with, and penicillin because, you know, both of those things actually have something to do with disease pathology. So, but anyway, um, but there are some things that these posters did do, right? So they did perpetuate sexism in uh, World War II. Um, as you can tell, like the onus of, you know, disease transmission is on women. It's not men. Somehow the penis is completely, you know, exempt from, you know, disease transmission. It's just like really awful looking women or clean women. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a mixed bag. Um, <laughs> these ones are great too. Uh, they're obviously a lot more military sort of themed. Uh, men who know say no to prostitutes because only prostitutes are spreaders of syphilis and gonorrhea. Um, and as you can tell, you know, a lot of these posters focus specifically on syphilis and gonorrhea. And one of our um, wonderful nerd night uh, folks earlier had said that they had a false positive for syphilis, which I thought was very interesting. Um, fun fact, syphilis is on the rise. Um, so it's just, it's not, it's not the, it's not the STD that your grandpa got. It is for everybody. Um, and then of course the other one, I just love that there's a gun involved because gun sex, I mean, like what can go wrong? How can you not love that? Um, especially with a winking woman, don't take chances with pickups. Um, and for those of you that don't know what a VD is, that's a venereal disease, not really commonly used anymore, but, um, yeah, loose women may also be loaded with disease. Again, another nice little example of, you know, World War II uh, sexism and, you know, hey, women are the only ones that are perpetuating these things. Somehow women are the only ones that are having, having sex, even though they're giving it to men. But anyway, um, <laughs> these ones are great too. The one... <laughs> The uh, one that's yellow and green is probably my favorite because I love that the tagline is, I take one everywhere I take my penis, which I think is still relevant today. Like if you're going out and your penis is coming too, take a condom with you. Like I actually really still feel this is very relevant. Um, and even in the time of Corona, wherever you're taking your penis, take a condom and you know, a mask and still keep your six feet dis difference. There's been a lot of really interesting, uh, you know, people have been asking like, well, can I still have sex? You know, if, um, if I have COVID or if I'm nervous that my partner has COVID, well, if you can somehow still have sex and still keep a six foot distance, like you should really let the CDC and WHO know that because I'm sure they would love to promote that kind of health behavior. Obviously the short answer is no, like, I mean, unless you're, I mean, you could do mutual masturbation. That's probably fine. But back to the posters. Um, so, 
you know, this is sort of the flip side, right? Like, so this is the flip side of, you know, machismo, masculinity as a motivator for men to be responsible um, and not, you know, and, and use protection. The other ones are interesting too, because it wasn't necessarily like you should use protection. It's that you should be on the lookout for like these women that are loaded with disease. Um, so, you know, as you can sort of see too, there's like this change in time, depending on uh, the audience and also the subject of the poster um, and how they decide to communicate that message. Clearly very uh, problematic for multiple reasons. And of course, like we don't see sexism anymore, right? Like sexism is a thing of the past. Women, you know, are totally equal and we're never blamed for being whores, right? Like that just doesn't happen in 2020. So we solved it guys, we did it, right? Well, not really. Of course, if you're an actual person who has a vagina and, you know, has lived in this world. So, but a little bit of history on these posters themselves. Um, so these were commissioned by the Works Progress Administration and the War Advertising Council. And what's amazing is that they had just a ton of artists that produced these kinds of posters. Um, and, you know, you may be asking yourself like, why is there so much focus on STIs? Well, that's because STIs were a huge problem in World War II. Um, if you got gonorrhea, you would be essentially out of the field for 30 days. That's how long it would take uh, for uh, the infirmary to treat you. Um, and then you could re-enter you know, the fight. So it sort of made sense to try and prevent the spread of gonorrhea and syphilis um, especially when penicillin wasn't necessarily largely used for, for syphilis. And, um, you know, we wanted our guys on the battlefield so that we could win the war against, you know, um, Germany and all that. So anyway, um, so yeah, I mean, what an, I, I think what's really cool about this whole thing is that you get to see this really interesting intersection between art and public health, which I don't really think we see. I mean, we're starting to see a lot more now. We'll talk a little bit more about, you know, social media and sort of that's its influence on uh, public health messaging. But, you know, uh, it's fascinating, right? Like imagine being an artist um, in, the 19, in the 1940s and being asked to, you know, make a poster about, you know, syphilis and gonorrhea. I mean, like what a, what a great contract. Um, there's also these, these are really, I, I put these two together because, you know, it's, um, they're very stark and very negative. I mean, the fact that like, this is a poster from the 1940s and they say goddamn bitch on one of them, which is just like insane to me. Like, I mean, woo, it's like shocking, even 2020. But when you put it in that context, I think it's like crazy, but rap before you tap. That seems like maybe a 90s catchphrase, but they were still using it in the 40s. Or maybe, no, they, the OG was in the 40s. They were still using it in the 90s. Um, but yeah, goddamn bitch said she was clean. Ooh, again, the onus is on women. And then on the flip side, self-control is self-preservation. Pick up spread syphilis and gonorrhea. So now it's, hey guys, like, be careful. You, prostitutes are just walking petri dishes have some self-control maybe at the time like kellogg was a part of this and was just like hey eat some cereal and that'll help you not only not masturbate but definitely not you know want to pick up prostitutes but so yeah so again like even though that one in particular is promoting self-control it's still focused on um on women right like pickups you know, not, not the fact that, and a lot of these obviously are focused on prostitutes and like, you know, sex work, but, um, men weren't just having sex with prostitutes, which was also very interesting. So where does propaganda sort of fall into all of this? Right. Um, so what is propaganda? Let's, let's define that. Right. I am a, I am a college instructor. So I always have to like operationalize, uh, what my, <laughs> what my definitions are. So it's the spreading of ideas, information, or rumor for the purpose of helping or injuring an institution, a cause, or a person. 
which is kind of vague, right? Like, I feel like there's a lot of things that might fall into the definition of propaganda that we may not necessarily consider propaganda, right? Um, an institution. So interestingly enough, so the, congreg the Congregation de Propaganda Fide was actually a, um, <laughs> it's, it's Italian for Congregation of Propagating the Faith. Uh, this was established in the 17th century and it was created to distribute a, a propaganda to further missionary activities of the church. So even the church saw the you know, utility of using propaganda as a way to get their message out. And I think that, you know, again, like there's a lot of different things that sort of fall into this category of propaganda, right? Um, you know, a cause, a cause might be a war, right? Like how do we combine patriotism and the health behavior, right? Like, hey, wrap it up, wrap your penis up because we got to win the war. Loose, li loose lips sink ships. So, you know, so again, it's, it's you know, sort of, we want to be able to spread ideas and information, right? So uh, information about being safe by using nationalism or or a war or a national crisis as a way to get that information out. Um, so, and obviously there are people, right? Like we're, you know, here we have a picture of General Mao, right? Um, lots of dictators love to use propaganda. Um, and of course, it's not only to help their cause and help them keep power, but it's also to, you know, um, oppress dissidents and make sure that they stay in power and, and injure anything that might, you know, um, threaten their dictatorship. So, but you know, it's interesting because we think when we think about propaganda, we think a lot about dictatorships. Um, but propaganda, again, is used in all different types of governments in the private sector. Um, so, you know, it's, it's actually a pretty big term. So why should we care? You know, do the ends justify the means? If we're using propaganda and it's working, right? If, if we're using propaganda to get people to brush their teeth and they're, and they're brushing their teeth, you know, like, what's the big deal about that? Like, they're doing what they should be doing. They're, you know, um, their teeth are cleaner and they're not having to go to the dentist. And maybe we're putting, you know, dentists out of work. That might be bad. But um, unfortunately, when we scare people, right, it may work for a while, but people eventually learn to not be scared of things, right? So, um, but, you know, stigma and shame, those are barriers for people to actually access the things that they may need or to be able to engage in the behavior that they want to engage in or that they should be engaging in to, to keep themselves safe and healthy. So it also erodes trust in public health institutions, right? Like we see, you know, um, you know, we look at vintage posts, uh, you know, posters like that you know, as a woman, you might think like, oh, like the public health department really has it out for me. Like, why would I ever, you know, if, how am I as a woman supposed to protect myself when all of this messaging is focused on men and it's, you know, basically making me the cause of, you know, spreading disease when men are just as capable of spreading STIs. Um, so that's why public health is a big deal. And it's still a big deal, as I'm sure you are all aware. Um, we see it a lot more. Um, we've seen it throughout history and we see it, I mean, obviously in public health, but with the age of the internet, we see it a lot. And I'm, and I actually, so when I first did this presentation, I had a lot of anti-vax um, propaganda on here, but uh, you know, with a global pandemic, the internet is just ripe with just beautiful fruits for the picking. Um, so this is, I, I kept this one up because it's crazy. Um, it's a baby doll with, um, with a bunch of needles sticking out of it, right? Um, and this is what we would call a meme or meme. I really, I call it a meme. I think that's how you say it. Um, but again, like this, what does this image say? This image is all about, you know, essentially uh, scaring people into not wanting to vaccinate because, oh my God, look at that baby. It's full of full of needles, right? And people don't like needles. So what the hell is a meme? Well, uh, it's an element of culture or system of behavior that may be considered to be passed from one individual to another by non-genetic means, especially an imitation. Sounds very similar to a virus, interestingly enough. 
Um, these are some ones that I've seen in regards to COVID. 5G somehow spreads COVID, which is like, that's not a thing. That's not a thing. That's not physically possible. If you believe in science, I don't even say, if you use the scientific method and you believe in the theories regarding physics, that's just not possible. So also, of course, that somehow Bill Gates is using this as an opportunity to put mind control devices and vaccines. I, I don't even want to explain that because it doesn't even make any sense either. Um, of course, Dr. Fauci is a deep state plant. We're seeing, a, and a lot of these obviously are political, right? So we're seeing, you know, um, the politi politicization of public health um, with a global pandemic. I saw this one, that like cocaine kills coronavirus. That actually might be really exciting for some people, but it doesn't. It does not. It does not kill the coronavirus, just as an FYI. Um, so, you know, we've been dealing with, um, obviously, like, I'm sure there was a lot of propaganda, actually, it, just in general. So, for instance, the Spanish flu, it's called the Spanish flu, even though it did not originate in Spain. In fact, they think it might have actually originated in, a army, in an army base in Kansas. Um, but calling it Spanish flu, kind of like calling it the Chinese virus is a way to, you know, spread propaganda and also, I don't know, racism and all the other types of bigotry you can imagine. It's not helpful. It, it, it doesn't, it doesn't protect anybody. Um, but, but of course, humans have been doing this for a long time. We've had anti-vaxxers um, since the founding of this nation. Um, and this is just sort of a, um, an example of that. Uh, this was from, you um, Battle Creek, Michigan, which actually I'm from Michigan, um, but it's basically a pamphlet about how vaccination is a curse um, and, you know, how vaccine can cause injury, which we still see people promoting that, um, that myth now. So if you'd like to think of um, propaganda in, the, in terms of, you know, sort of a virus, right? Uh, so propaganda is the RNA, right? Like it's the, it's like the, the sort of virus piece, right? So it's like the, it's the, it's just like the content, right? It's the content. The meme is the virus. The meme is what gets shared. It's the thing that people see and they feel like, oh my gosh, I totally relate to that. Even though like it may not be true, but I want to share it. And so, you know, obviously propaganda can be very dangerous because it can be just as infectious as an actual virus. I love this because I, I saw this on Reddit, actually. Um, it's sort of a play on, um, you know, the World War II uh, posters, but it's all about, you know, uh, protecting our healthcare workers and staying inside. And that's my presentation. So uh, I hope you learned something. I hope at least you learned that 5G doesn't spread coronavirus because I swear if I see another person share that, I'm going to... Well, I'm not going to light myself on fire because that would be terrible, but it's just really crazy to me. So, but I will make fun of you because that's like the only thing I can do from the comfort of my home. So anywho, <laughs> I will stop sharing. Thank you so much, Lindsay Grove. That was amazing. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I'm so glad I found out that cocaine doesn't yeah, you know, uh, drinking bleach also does not kill coronavirus. I also saw that as something that was being shared. Wow. I, you know, you, can, you can't make this stuff up. Just right. I mean, somebody's making this stuff up. Somebody's doing it, I guess, right? That's true. There's a lot of grifters out there that are trying to, you know, peddle their, I, I don't know, injections of sugar water and essential oils as uh, the cure for coronavirus. So the snake oil salesman lives. <laughs> right, right. And what is it? Chlora, chlorophen something. Yeah, it's <laughs> uh, snake oil. It's a chloroclean, I think it is. <laughs> I mean, maybe that is, I should say. Anyway, um, so now it's time for questions. If you have a few minutes. Yeah. Yay. Um, so we have a couple questions coming in. Um, one is, are there other times in history where national leaders have spread false propaganda and how can that be handled? 
For example, Twitter taking down the Brazilian president's tweets. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, that's, oh gosh, there's so many, there's a lot of examples. Um, I mean, I, I did talk about the, um, the, the flu pandemic of 1918, which a lot of people call the Spanish flu. Um, you know, oh my gosh, there's, there's a lot of different examples. Um, I'm, and of course now I'm blinking, but that's like the one that I can like think of off the top mm -hmm. of my hand because, because everybody keeps talking about it and trying to relate sort of like what's going on with coronavirus and what's going on with, um, or, you know, in comparison to the, the, uh, 1918 influenza. Um, well, I also I thought know, there was, I, sorry. I thought was sorry. thing that you said you related how we talk about the Spanish flu to the China virus, because this talking about it as the Spanish flu is so accepted now and yeah. it's technically. Yeah, it, it, it originated here. Um, yeah. I mean, and again, like it, it, that sort of, that is a mechanism for getting people to think, of, you know, to essentially use the, to other, you know, like only, you know, other cultures, other people, other ethnicities, they're the only ones that either get it or they're the ones that cause it, right? So it's just another form of xenophobia. Right. So, yeah. Um, I mean, actually, I mean, another case in point is HIV, right? I mean, when HIV, um, when, you know, we were first sort of trying to figure out how to address that epidemic, which by the way, Dr. Fauci was a part of that. Like that's how long he's been around. Um, you know, like there was so many things out there about, you know, like how HIV could be caused. Obviously it was called grid for a long time. Like the, um, it, it was considered a gay disease. And so, I mean, unfortunately, like politicization of diseases is the rule more so than the exception a lot of times. Which, yeah, like the HIV crisis, that politicism and prejudice caused it to spread during that time period, just like now. And like apparently probably during syphilis too. Oh my gosh. Syphilis. So, <laughs> All right, so sorry. Uh, yeah, Lindsay, I gotta, gotta give you the, uh, the virtual hook here. We're, we're keeping to a tight schedule. So everyone watching the stream, give a big virtual round of applause for us. Uh, oh, thank you. Um, I will say two notes of warning. Don't get syphilis or gonorrhea. And two, don't try to dispel the fact that doing a lot of cocaine cures corona. <laughs> because we're that's, die trying. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I don't know. Maybe it could be fun. I don't know. All right. So thanks, everyone. All right. So with that, let's um, pass it over. We are now 12.5% of the way done. Let's move to presentation number two, uh, brought to you by the good folks at Nerd Night Orlando. So uh, Ricardo, take it away. Hi, can everybody hear me? Unmute yourself first. There you go. Am I good? All right. Sorry. Uh, I don't know if you could tell, but I tried to set up a little green screen here so I could show what I've been doing for the last month since we haven't been able to host Nerd Night. I've watched 45 episodes of the 1994 Spider-Man animated series. I thought it'd be cool if I showed a little thing, but I kind of screwed up the green screen here. It's more of like a gray screen. Uh, but anyway, um, we just, uh, we're gonna sell our seven year anniversary of Nerd Night um, this uh, past March. And sadly we had to uh, postpone it uh, because of this uh, Corona uh, crisis that we're having. Uh, and actually this past week we would have had a Yuri's Night event, which is a, uh, a space themed event that we have every year, obviously in celebration of the uh, first guy to go into space. Uh, I'm sure most of you know who that is. I have no need to say that, but uh, I, I, I Although we couldn't do that and obviously everybody's social distancing, I am super happy to be a part of this and to have my buddy Derek Demeter here who has been a mainstay at Nerd Night for uh, uh, literally the last seven years that we've been doing it. I think actually Derek's very first Nerd Night talk ever was April 2013. Holy shit, actually, so this is, this is actually Derek's seven year anniversary right now. So. Congratulations to Derek for uh, being around for so long. 
and for uh, for us not to scare him away. And he's done so many talks over the years, uh, space related talks, and he's actually even done talks for Nerd Night Miami and the ladies at Nerd Night St. Pete, who we just saw previously. And uh, yeah, I'm just really great, happy to have Derek. He is the um, obviously he's a very popular speaker here because we love talking about space topics here in uh, Orlando since we're so close to the space coast. And uh, you know, when we're not doing like you know, when we're not being reported about with these creepy Florida man stories, we're we're doing really cool stuff down here. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Derek Demper, who is the uh, planetarium director at Seminole State. Uh, uh, college here in uh, Central Florida. And uh, Derek, uh, take it away. All right. Thank you, Ricardo. And thank all of you uh, with nerd, with all the associated nerd nights and of course uh, having this really awesome virtual session. Uh, it's really great to be able to share with all of you some of the cool things that we uh, we do in the uh, Orlando area. So uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start my presentation here. And uh, so you want to get the hell off this planet, huh? I mean, essentially, 2020 has essentially been a year from hell so far. I mean, I feel like every single time we do something with 2020, you have to ask yourself, like John Luc Picard, diamond report, right? And 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 so far, uh, you know, many of us are, are are anxious, are getting depressed. Some of us are are dealing with a lot of issues. Um, this is not a really good time for us. Uh, to be dealing with the things we are right now. Uh, but of course, before 2020 and, and still going on and all that, there are many other reasons why you might want to say, you know what, I'm going to kick this planet uh, and just get out of here. Uh, you might have issues, of course, obviously with coronavirus and all the things that are happening in our world today. There's also pollution, massive amounts of pollution, lots and lots of issues with pollution, dealing with uh, you know, also how it affects climate change. Uh, I know poor, our poor polar bears are really suffering up in the Arctic right now, dealing with the mass ice uh, melting and of course also issues dealing in, in places like Antarctica and all of the glaciation that's basically been, been, been torn apart because of, of climate change. And, uh, you know, essentially there's also this war on science. And of course, I'm sure, you know, all this going on, the most important thing is you don't want to be around this person anymore. And uh, I'm I don't blame any of you. And of course, all the other horrible leaders that we have in our world today, even though there's a lot of great leaders out there, it just feels like there's just no escape. So the way to get out of here is to literally get out, right? But the question is, is that is it really feasible or is it really easy for us to leave planet Earth? And we're going to take a look at some of the ways that we can do that. Where can we go? How can we get there? And maybe, just maybe, at the very end, we can try very hard to clean up our mess. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to look at kind of the history behind what we've done so far in terms of human space exploration. As Ricardo mentioned earlier, we're very close to Kennedy Space Center. And uh, my buddy Justin and I, who work at the planetarium, get a chance to go out to Kennedy Space Center quite a bit actually photograph and to see launches close up. I had the very, very, uh, you know, humbling privilege to be able to be on top of the vehicle assembly building, the thing that's actually assembling the rockets and watch several rocket launches from the roof of that. And every time I go, I just, I feel like a little, little kid. It's incredible. But, you know, essentially we've done some really incredible stuff so far in terms of space exploration. Of course, uh, Ricardo just mentioned Yuri Gagarin. Of course, Yuri Gagarin is the first a human to be in space, space is a relative word, right? Essentially orbit around the earth. Uh, in, in many ways, it wasn't truly space, but you know, who's, who's really judging that, right? Uh, and of course, later on, we, the United States follows suit. We were in a Cold War with the USSR. We're dealing with the space race at the time. And of course, the goal is to go to the moon, right? And here we have the Mercury 7, uh, the seven test pilots that eventually would lead to the development of the first astronaut corps. Later on, we have uh, in, in the Gemini missions, or Gemini, if you're, you know, you work for NASA, um, is Ed White, first uh, human to uh, spacewalk. So again, we finally leave this little capsule and we actually perform some spacewalk routines and we're slowly baby steps getting our way into more and more complicated uh, procedures. And of course, eventually, 
Uh, we build the Saturn V rocket. We launch people into space and we eventually travel to another world. About 250,000 miles away, of course, is the moon. And we had the opportunity to actually visit the moon and do some really cool stuff. We collect some moon rocks, got to actually do some science experiments. And of course, we also got a chance to uh, check out this little lunar rover on the right side there. You can see uh, it went a whopping two miles an hour, just in case you know you really feel like uh, being adventurous and, and hightailing it on the lunar surface. Um, but since then though, we haven't gone back anywhere else. We haven't gone back to the moon. We haven't even tra traversed anything beyond that. We've pretty much been stuck in low or earth orbit since then. And uh, you know, for as many of us here that are here today, probably were young enough to remember this. I'm actually teaching students at the planetarium right now. Well, not in the planetarium at the moment, we're doing virtual programs, but we teach students right now that have no idea what this is. It's just, it reminds you that you are getting older and I'm at that point now where, oh my gosh, there are people that don't know what this is. This is of course the space shuttle, the orbiter discovery there, the airplane like um, spacecraft. Uh, but eventually we retired the space shuttle in 2010. And we, we as United States haven't had a chance to send our own people up into the United, into, into space. We've had to use the Russians with their Soyuz capsule to get up to space. And right now we are still doing stuff today. We are utilizing the International Space Station, very important, because if you wanna leave this planet and you wanna deal with interplanetary or interstellar travel, you gotta know how the physiology of the human body will actually affect our, 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 our ability to actually do space travel. And right now, Mark Kelly sets the record for the longest person in space. Uh, excuse me, not Mark Kelly, that's his brother, Scott Kelly. Yes, yeah, Scott Kelly, um, uh, being the first uh, person to spend uh, over a year in space. And we're starting to actually see some physiological issues. A lot of things that uh, Scott Kelly has noticed when he's come down from, uh, from being in, in orbit some of the things that our human body actually deals with. So we're starting to see and starting to learn the physiology. There's other astronauts up there that are doing similar studies and hopefully we'll get a better grasp of how space travel really will affect the human body. Because the plan is eventually we're gonna leave earth again and we're gonna go somewhere else. We're eventually gonna go back to the moon and hopefully go to places like Mars. Now, since then, again, we've been sending astronauts on Soyuz capsules but actually next month, hopefully, keep our fingers crossed, two American astronauts are going to launch off of um, the SpaceX uh, Falcon rocket. Again, so SpaceX is working on their own rockets. They're, conjoining, they're joining up with uh, NASA to send uh, astronauts up to the International Space Station. So hopefully next month, we'll be sending people up uh, from American soil again. So kind of cool, right? And of course, eventually our plan is to go to Mars and the moon with Artemis. Artemis is the next lunar mission that's hopefully going to happen in the next several years. We're gonna be uh, launching them off of the, launching astronauts off of the space launch system. It's massive rocket, larger than the Saturn V right here from Kennedy Space Center. So again, as Ricardo said, we have a lot of crazy stuff going on in Florida, but we also have a lot of cool stuff going on in Florida. So definitely some really cool things to look forward to. Now, of course, the main goal right now is to go to Mars, right? Our plan is all this stuff is really, you know, high tail Elon Musk is, wants to build this million colony place on Mars. Is that feasible? Is it feasible to actually build that large of a civilization on Mars? Is Mars the next place? Is, if you wanna get off of earth, is Mars your best choice? The answer is technically yes. However, Mars isn't like Earth at all. Uh, it, it's very similar in some aspects, but think about this. Mars has a very, very, very thin atmosphere, just a little bit of carbon dioxide. It has no magnetic field that shields it from this thing called the solar wind, which sends streams of particles and also doesn't shield it from ultraviolet radiation to the point where you can get third degree burns, skin burns, and skin cancer by just being exposed for a short period of time on the, on the surface of Mars. So most likely we're gonna have to build underground if we want to live on Mars, mostly in lava tubes and other subterranean places. 
Also, the soil of Mars itself can kill you. Uh, most of the soil on Mars is toxic to human uh, lungs. If you were to breathe in the perchlorates and other uh, minerals that are found in the Martian soil, it's like breathing in asbestos, stuff that's dangerous for your lungs, definitely something you don't want to inhale. So as you can see, Mars is a very, very dangerous place. And this is our most Earth-like world in the solar system. Yeah, we find Europa, a moon of Jupiter, has water. We find that Enceladus has ice geysers. But really, Earth is the special world. We have evolved and adapted from to Earth. This is our special place. So, so far, really isn't a good alternative in the solar system, if you think about it. So what's the next choice? The next choice is to look for Earth-like worlds in other parts of the galaxy. We call them exoplanets. These are planets that go around other stars. And we have spacecraft like this one here, the Kepler spacecraft. It has space telescope. It was looking for Earth-like worlds. And just recently, we've launched the TESS satellite. This is the um, this is satellite that's going to be surveying the entire uh, sky for Earth-like worlds and other exoplanets. So the hope is that at some point, one another, we're going to find several worlds that are Earth-like that orbit around a star like our sun or orbit in a such a way where it gets what we call the Goldilocks zone. I'm sure all of you have read Goldilocks and the Three Bears at some point in your life. And you know that Goldilocks likes everything to be just right. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the just right conditions for human life. And that of course is really nice temperatures, a nice solid atmosphere, mostly nitrogen and oxygen, a pretty decent amount of one G of weight. So about the same uh, G forces here on earth. And of course we want liquid water. If we find liquid water, there's a great chance that it's a place where we can suitably live. So, so far we are hopefully looking for these worlds and we found several of them. Uh, there's lots of potential earth worlds. And I like to say potential because we only have a very limited knowledge about what these planets are. Uh, we don't really know whether these planets are, what's in the atmosphere quite a hundred percent. There have been studies that show that there are planets we know that have water, but we're still not hundred percent sure. The James Webb telescope, if it ever goes up, will hopefully be able to look at these planets and look for uh, different types of gases in the atmosphere that suggest that this world is very Earth-like. So we're still at the infancy and in understanding worlds beyond our solar system. So, but this is an exciting time for science. But as you can see here, there's lots of different potential worlds and there's count there and it's counting. There's constantly new and more and more potentially habitable worlds out there that we're discovering. So if we find a world out there, let's say you've done all your studies, you found a world, great. How in the world do we get there? Well, we start looking into propulsion systems. And the first one you might think of yourself as an ion propulsion, like a TIE fighter twin ion engine, that's what TIE fighter means. Well, an ion engine is not really good for interstellar travel. It's good for small spurts to kind of move the spacecraft around. Um, spacecraft today use ion propulsion to help kind of uh, redirect them and change the position so they can fall into orbits and things like that, or move their orbit, all the things like that. So ion engines are not good candidates for long-term propulsion. What if you want to do Count Dooku style? Yes, some of you remember Count Dooku from Star Wars, and you want to do a solar sail. Well, solar sails are a good opportunity if you are close to a star, like the Earth. The solar wind, which again is a stream of particles that are shooting off of the sun, bombard these solar sails and push, like wind, push our spacecraft further away. And it can get you near the fraction of the speed of light. So this actually is a good uh, resource to use for interplanetary travel. Let's say we want to go to Mars. Maybe a solar sail might be a good option to go to a planet from, say, Earth to Mars or something like that. But the further away you go, the less uh, we call flux, so the less amount of solar wind that you interact with, which means that the less wind, less push. So solar, solar uh, sails are really good as one way of getting somewhere, but you want to add another propulsion system to your spacecraft. So it's kind of like a sailboat today. It has a sail, but most sailboats also have a motor attached to them when, of course, there's no wind. So the next option is what can you do? Well, you can use ramjets, or in this case, uh, hydrogen ramjets. What they do is they scoop the hydrogen that actually is pretty prevalent in the universe. Hydrogen is the most 
basic element in the universe. And the hydrogen gets scooped in and gets accelerated and allows the spacecraft to shoot off into space, going pretty fast. We're talking near, uh, fractions of the speed of light as well. So a mix between the two might be a good option. Uh, here's another, uh, uh, this is called the Daedalus Project. This is actually one that uh, a group of, um, uh, I think the Planetary Science Society or, or one of those organizations actually helped build a kind of a, a, a you know, a, 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 a sort of a kind of a idea of what of, of, of hydrogen uh, ramjet would look like. The best option is probably going to be antimatter. So antimatter sounds very science fiction right now, but antimatter is a potential to get very close to the speed of light. And if you can do that, um, well, that's great. But we're also limited on a few things. One, we have to accelerate at one G of thrust. If we accelerate for a very long period of time, more than one G, we can harm our humans that are in the spacecraft. So we want to keep the amount of long-term G forces to be close to one G. We could probably use a little bit higher G forces for a small burst, but for a long-term space travel, we want to keep it about one G of thrust. And of course, as we get closer to, uh, to um, you know, our, our, our location, we have to decelerate at one G of thrust in order for us to eventually slow down so we don't, you know, miss the planet. Now, of course, you're going to say, okay, well, you know, we can get pretty close to the speed of light, right? Well, can't we go to speed of light? Well, no, that guy with the mustache uh, said, no, you can't. You can't go to speed of light. You'll be pure energy at that point. E equals MC squared, that whole thing that a lot of people know about. They have no idea what it means. Basically means that you, as you get close to the speed of light, you, be, you, you get close, time condenses on you, energy, you become pure energy essentially, and your mass equals zero. So in reality, you can't truly get to the exact speed of light but you can get pretty close. And at that time, space will contract. It will get smaller. And the amount of time space between you and the, and, and the object is, 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 is shorter. So you actually can make, you can actually get somewhere real, real quickly. But Einstein also had this thing called special relativity, is that time is relative to based on your speed and, you know, how, and how fast you're going. So here's the problem with this whole thing. Let's say you finally get to a planet that is Earth-like, and you're like, "Ah, oh, man, I forgot to get my my uh, you know my, my my video game console, and I need to go back to Earth." Well, the problem is, is that if this object is a hundred light years away, and you you hightail it to this planet, and you're going the speed of light, just for fun sakes, you actually can go to speed of light. When you turn around and try to go back for your gaming console, guess what? Two hundred years on Earth would have passed but it might have seemed like maybe a couple of years for you. So as you can see, relative, relativity is kind of against us. So really, traveling to another planet is a one-way road. There's no going back. Once you leave Earth and you go to a world, there's really no chance to go back. So the most likely case is, is that we're gonna have a mass exodus. If we find another world beyond our own, there's a chance that most likely we need to get off the earth for some reason, whether it be that the earth is no longer sustainable or that our sun is getting fatter and fatter. Actually in about a couple of 500 million years, our sun will become so large that the heat from the sun is so hot, it, our planet is just unsustainable. We can't live on planet earth again. So eventually we gotta get out of here. So we would have to build these big giant world ships containing hundreds of millions of people that we will launch to worlds like an exoplanet 100 light years away. So really, when we go somewhere that's somewhere far away, we're really going there permanently. So we really got to know for sure whether this place is really the place we want to go to. Now, there are ways to break the laws of special relativity. And Star Trek has actually done a pretty good job at that, warp engines. Warp engines actually warp space time around you so you can actually cheat space, uh, the speed of light, because actually space time travels faster than the speed of light. So you can technically cheat by uh, warping space around you by very intense gravity fields. So technically you could actually travel back and forth um, by somehow manipulating space time itself. And theoretically it is possible to do that. Um, you could even potentially build an Einstein Rosen bridge. If you're a Thor fan, you could technically have an ability to connect a wormhole or a Stargate fan. You have the ability to connect a wormhole and jump from one, two places to the other. But finding the two connections, 
that's really difficult, okay? I mean, if you're trying to find, you know, uh, a connection between two black holes to create a, a wormhole, I mean, you have a better chance of building a warp engine and having to figure out where a wormhole is, unless you have an alien, ancient alien race that leaves a big, you know, technological piece that allows you to do that. So who knows? But right now, though, that's our best way to kind of break the, the laws of relativity there. Now, let's say we finally get to our exoplanet. Well, remember, Earth is a very special place. We have evolved on planet Earth. We evolved on our 1G of, 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 uh, of, of gravity. We've developed based on our, our atmosphere conditions, mostly nitrogen, uh, you know, 79% oxygen, 21% uh, uh, nitrogen, 21% oxygen or so, give or take, and a little rest of its trace gases. We've also adapted to the fact that we get a certain amount of sunlight, all these things. Our Earth is the base, the best spacecraft out there. But let's say we get to an exoplanet. If that exoplanet has just a little bit more oxygen, it's too toxic for human life. If it has a little bit less oxygen in the atmosphere, it's too toxic for human life. So Avatar actually did a really good at, job at kind of showing this off that you know on the, on the moon of Pandora, they actually had to wear a vape, uh, respirators and things to help them breathe to create a little bit more stable atmosphere so that they, would, they wouldn't be able to breathe too much oxygen or something like that. Maybe it has a little bit more gravity. More gravity means more weight on our bones, more the fact that our, our hearts have to pump harder to get the blood around you. I mean, all these things are factors. So really, what's the best way to do it? Well, the best way to do it is slow and steady. Instead of going to a, to a planet that within about a year, you just go in the speed of light or near the speed of light, maybe slow it down a little bit. Maybe make these world ships go for 100,000 years through space. And over that 100,000 years, actually artificially evolve humanity to become more adaptable to higher levels of oxygen and all these different factors. So that way, when we actually get to the planet, we are a new species. Yes, yes, folks. There's a high chance that when we get to another world, like another Earth-like world, we may very well likely be a wholly different species than what we are today. So in reality, we become the aliens, the Earthlings that are still here compared to the ones that are actually on this exoplanet. They may actually be cousins or, or, or not, not the same um, you know, not the same homo sapiens that we were when we left. So this actually becomes a very cool science fiction idea, right? So who knows? Now, the point of all this is to prove us a point here. So you want to get off your planet? Well, it's not as easy as you think. It's not as easy as grabbing an enter uh, enterprise and just hightailing out into space. So what's the next best option? We have a pretty good spaceship right here. Planet Earth, isn't it gorgeous? There are no boundaries. There, these, are all fic, these are all fictitious things, right? These are all things that we've created, manifested. Maybe artificial is what the word I was looking for. Um, you know, you can't really tell that there's a pandemic going on right now in space, but either way, we have things like this. Our human mind, our ability to teach others, to hopefully make a better world for our next generation and generations beyond. And hopefully we can fight a lot of these things that are going on today that make you want to leave your planet. So maybe we have to work together as a team to clean this place up because really, truly as an astronomer, this is our best spaceship. This is our best planet. This is the most habitable, most wonderful place. And unfortunately we're screwing things up a little bit right now, but I like to believe kind of like in the Star Trek utopia that we can get over these issues and maybe make this place a better world for everybody. And so with that, I want to thank you all for spending a few hot seconds with me, learning about planets and what, what the reality of the thing is. I do, uh, and in reality, we have to science the shit out of things in order for us to actually keep going. So, you know, support science, you know, get people to get excited about science. And of course, that's what we do at the planetarium. We get people excited about science. And if you're interested in science, uh, you know, hopefully you can join us at one of our other programs. Uh, we have a Facebook as well, and we do virtual star parties. So I encourage you to keep learning, no matter if it's through us or somebody else, through Nerd Night. Uh, keep learning, keep changing your mind, and hopefully we can make this place a, a better world. So again, thank you all for, um, for sharing some time with me here, and uh, thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Derek. Uh, can you see me? Am I here? Can I, can I be you heard? are can somewhat, I be somewhat there in the uh, <laughs> of, of Marvel world. I, 
I am so sorry. I thought it was going to be so cool if I set up my like background. But what I forgot is, by the way, is that I'm using a very old laptop. And the you color settings like, are off. You look like so, Zordon, actually. You look like Zordon <laughs> in Power Rangers. That's okay, really well, cool. I'll take it. It's yeah, a compliment yeah. now. I have this gray background, but I'm wearing a black nerd night shirt, if you can tell. So <laughs> oh, there you that go. Was that kind of, work perfect. Uh, just keep it like that. Gray and black are going together. So we have a question here. Uh, yes. It says, if, uh, wait, I just lost it. Hold on one second. If I travel, oh, wait, the comments are moving too fast. Uh oh. Uh, I'm 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 the uh, older millennial, so you know uh, this, this is actually <laughs> hey, happening. Hey, you and I are about the same age, my friend. Um, I think it said before, it, like moved away from me. I think it said that uh, if you travel through speed of light, will you be thinner? Is that what the question was? I think. Uh, You'd be yeah. Thinner. Uh, I mean, you would lose a lot of your mass, so yeah, you would be thinner. I mean, really thin, really, really. Oh, wow, thin. great question. <laughs> all right, so that is a actually, yes. No mass at all. Would you would be the thinnest you can ever be. Oh, that was from uh, uh, Faye, uh, Faye Justicia Lind. All right, we have an, any more questions? Let's see. Um, yeah, I got one, Ricardo. We had one from uh, Christopher Adams asking if, um, do we really need an exoplanet to settle or could just building a space station do the job itself? Do we really need soil to sustain ourselves? Well, that, that's a good well, one. Well, yeah, I mean, that is true. You could conceivably build a planet size, like uh, like some of the uh, the ring typed, you know, uh, space stations. I can't remember the name of it on the top of my head, but it's basically a ring that you could build an artificial atmosphere and you could spin it at 1G, so all that. And so technically, yes, you can do that, um, but uh, that would have to be a very large ring in order to support billions upon billions of people. Um, so I think because of the idea, and plus people like the idea of exploring another world rather than being cooped up in a space station uh, for the rest of their lives, um, just to kind of give them a feeling of being on another world. But I mean, it is quite possible. And most likely we are gonna end up doing that. A lot of our world ships most likely will be like space stations, uh, big giant space stations that will thrive in for a very long time. Can we do one more question real quick? Somebody just came in, it said, for interstellar travel, spaceships traveling near the speed of light will have to deal with the length contraction affecting their structural integrity. Any ideas from material science for much stronger spaceships? So I'm not an engineer, um, so I will say I'm not 100% sure on that question, but what I will say is that there will be technologies that we will have to develop um, to get to, to, to succumb those pressures. Yeah, those, that is actually a big issue with reaching the speed of light is just that sheer amount of force on you. Um, so that's definitely something that uh, will have to be investigated. That's why we need, you know, we, we at the planetarium, we inspire kids. We do our best to maybe inspire them to build these technologies. So, uh, but uh, that's a great question and uh, definitely something that we need to look into. Awesome, thank you, Derek. I'm gonna swing it back thank to you, uh, Matt. And uh, thank you, Melissa. I will definitely finish great presentation. Great. Thanks, Derek. Thanks, Ricardo. Uh, you are a, a mystery man uh, buried into the background. Okay, so uh, let's keep things moving along. We're at the quarter poll already. I want to do one quick Nerd Night Global plug as we continue here is that uh, Nerd Night, many presentations uh, generally don't get recorded around the world, but um, some have recently. In the last couple of years, we've been dedicating a few more resources towards properly editing and recording videos for later review. So if any of you are interested in uh, missing some Nerd Night Love or want to see what other people around the planet are presenting, you can subscribe at our YouTube channel, uh, which is simply youtube.com slash Nerd Night. And you, know, you can learn about things that are happening all over the world by our great presenters across the globe. Uh, with that, it is, uh, we're now up for uh, Nerd Night Madison. Uh, we're going to hand it over to uh, the Upper Midwest, and we're going to learn a little bit about mangroves because and biodiversity, because when you think Upper Midwest, you think mangroves. Uh, Jamie, go ahead and uh, take it away. Hello, nerds. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I am so excited to have Nerd Night back. I missed this in my life. I had an itch. I didn't know I needed. And Derek and Lindsay, thank you guys for scratching it. Um, uh, as Matt said, I'm Jamie, uh, co-boss of Madison Nerd Night. My fellow co-boss, Julie, could not make it tonight, so I'm going to have a little, little sip in her honor. Um, and I'm going to introduce our next presenter. I am very excited to introduce him. Uh, Tyler presented at Madison back in January, and man, 
it was fucking fun. I love Nerd Night because you learn some stuff and you walk away with uh, feelings that you didn't expect having, like fucking mangroves, man. They're so cool. And Tyler is very into them. And I'm excited for you all to get to join the mangrove party. Uh, Tyler is originally from Northern Virginia. He's at UW-Madison, uh, University of Wisconsin, uh, studying botany, as you will not be surprised. <laughs> Thank you for showing that off there, Tyler. And uh, he's really into mangroves. Like, that's the main thing that you need to know about it. And I will pass it off to Tyler. Oh, and I will say one thing. Uh, throw your questions in the chat. We'll be, we'll be looking forward to answering them at the end. Tyler, take it away. Cool. Uh, let me share my screen. And there we go. So uh, I'm here to talk to you about um, mangroves and why they're fantastic. Um, a little bit of disclaimer, I don't actually study mangroves. I study cottonwoods and aspens and their chemical ecology. However, mangroves are far and away my favorite plant because of the cool adaptations and their lifestyle. Um, plus, who doesn't like tropical plants? Um, so hopefully you'll be able to learn some things um, and realize why we should save the earth so we don't have to travel uh, through the universe to, uh, to, to new planets, everything. So a quick little overview um, as I get started here. Um, so I'm gonna talk about what are mangroves, uh, the distribution, a little bit about their evolution, um, their adaptations uh, to their unique environment, the benefits of mangroves and some of the threats facing them. So, so what are mangroves? First off, they're estuarine trees, all right? I'm hoping everybody knows what a tree is, uh, but if you don't know what an estuary is, that's when you have uh, seawater and freshwater they converge, they get a little mixy soup going on. Um, and then you got like the rainforest of the sea. Uh, estuaries are some of the most productive environments uh, yeah, in the uh, aquatic environments in the world, um, just from the sheer amount of nutrients coming off from the land combined with um, some of the uh, other uh, fun stuff from the sea. Um, so these are trees that live in estuaries. They live in a salty environment. Um, they are an example of convergence. Um, so when I say convergence, if you're not familiar with evolution, um, you've got divergence. So if you think about how humans, uh, we share traits with like uh, other primates, so like uh, orangutans uh, and gorillas, et cetera. Uh, we share a common ancestor, uh, but we have diverged. Uh, mangroves are an evidence of convergence. So they have distant uh, lineages of plants that exist in a similar environment and they converge on traits. Um, so thus we have 16 different families of plants. Yes, plants have families um, and 54 different species of mangroves. Um, so talking about the United States, um, yes, we're in uh, Wisconsin here and it did snow today, but talking about Florida mangroves, I'll reference these a few times throughout the talk. Um, we've got the red mangrove, you can see the species name, uh, genus name, um, and their species name. Uh, and so red mangroves are in the Malpighalis, so those are like the willow family, uh, not family, but order willow where willows are. Um, then you've got the uh, lamiel, so the black mangroves and that. So those are gonna be like your, your mint order. Um, and then the white mangroves and the myrtail, so that, that's uh, like a eucalyptus order of plants. So you can see there's uh, vastly different uh, lineages of plants that have converged on similar traits. Uh, and so this is just another example sort of thing. So you can see this was a study done in 2019 where they took a genome of the chloroplast of about 14 different mangrove species. Those are in red. Um, so we can see we got a, an order of mints. We've got our order of eucalyptus stuff. We've got our, uh, our maples and our citrus plants. Um, we've got our hibiscus. We've got our bean plants. And then we've got those, those pesky little willows and euphorbs. Um, and so you can see that there's many different types of plants that have these mangrove characteristics. There's even a fern mangrove. Um, and so with all these different lineages of plants, they have a pretty large distribution worldwide. Um, the highest diversity is in the east, so you can see the species richness is just like the measurement of amount of species there are. Um, and so those are going to be higher in uh, Oceania, um, around this area. Uh, you can't actually even see me. Um, over near uh, like Southeast Asia sort of thing. I can't, didn't even realize my mouse wasn't showing up. Um, the total area in 2000, the most recent statistic I can get, it was about uh, 137,000 uh, square kilometers. That's about the size of uh, Bangladesh or Greece or the state of New York. Um, but 75% of mangroves are found in just 15 countries. So for example, the Thunderbirds, largest mangrove forest in the world, 10,000 square kilometers, 60% of it's in Bangladesh, 40% is in India. Um, and there are 2.5 million people that live near that forest. So, so mangroves have a huge impact on human life, as we'll see later. Um, and the general distribution of all mangroves is about between uh, 30 degrees north latitude and 30 degrees south latitude. 
Um, so here's a colorized map if you're into that sort of thing. This is from the Smithsonian Ocean website, fantastic source for more mangroves. Um, but you can see that our highest biodiversity of mangroves is really over in this Oceana area. Um, with only like a couple over here in the new world. We get some boring stuff, but they're pretty cool. Um, so with this widespread uh, uh, distribution, um, one of these adaptations that I keep talking about. Well, let me get started. Um, so first off, first off, if you're a plant and you're gonna live in water, you need to not drown yourself. Um, that's just a general good rule. Um, they don't have gills or anything, so how are they gonna live? Prop roots, uh, quite literally propping themselves out of the water. So if you look at the picture on the right, you can see that we have all of our green material, all of our photosynthetic parts are gonna be above the water, even at high tide, uh, that tide's gonna fluctuate, but most of those green leaves should be out of the water uh, when it does, so that way the plant is still able to go through photosynthesis. Uh, and on the picture on the left, you can actually see one of these prop roots. It's got these little white dots on it. Those are lenticels. Those allow for greater gas exchange between the mangrove roots and the rest of the environment, so that way uh, those flooded roots are not getting any gas whatsoever. They're getting water, plenty of water, but no gas. Um, so by having these lenticels, those airborne roots are able to make up uh, for the loss of porous and uh, air-filled soil that mangroves do not have. Uh, and so these, these prop roots uh, can support so much more life. So you can see here on the, on the opening slide, you saw tons of fish and minnows. Um, you can see some here on the left thing. Uh, you've got some sponges going on in here. Sometimes there's oysters as well. Um, you can also see in the center photo that the mangroves actually um, create as uh, compared to this slide here where we've got some wave action going on. It's a much uh, calmer environment in that center photo. So mangroves do provide a wave break because the roots absorb a lot of the energy from the ocean. So a little more calmer environment. And then on the right, you can see an example of a buttress root. Um, it provides more uh, lateral support rather than vertical support. Um, and so you're in this ocean, you're in a salty environment, plants, surprise, spoiler, they don't like salt. Um, so how are you going to deal with that? Well, first off, humans deal with that by sweating. Mangroves deal with that by also sweating. Um, so they do have salt glands. So um, ideally, uh, there's still like some science out there on it. They're still trying to do research. Ideally, they, the roots are about 90% impermeable to salt. Um, and so there's some ideas about why that is. Um, some people think it's because in plants you have vacuoles and vacuoles are kind of like the bladder of a plant cell. They keep all the excess water and uh, other uh, chemicals and such there. So the thinking, uh, people think that uh, the roots um, have, their cells have vacuoles that uh, immobilize the salt there and it doesn't get transported through the xylem, through the ducts, uh, through the rest of the plant. Um, but what salt does go through gets exuded through these um, salt glands and you can see the glands in picture A that are marked by the little yellow things. Um, and then on the side there on the right, uh, you can see the actual granules of salt on the leaves. Now, a common misconception is that the yellow mangrove leaves are sacrificial leaves. If I get a cup full of salt, they're going to just die. That's not what's happening. Those leaves are just dying. They're, they're not, there's no reason they're not getting pumped with salt and then dying. They're just dying. Um, and so the yellow is because all the chlorophyll and all the excess nitrogen is being pulled out by the plant so it can use it for new leaves instead of just dropping it in the ocean. Um, so that's what's happening. All mangrove leaves pretty much have salt. Um, so we've dealt with salt, we've dealt with uh, rising waters, but now let's say we're not a red mangrove. Let's say that we don't experience prop roots. Let's say we're a black mangrove um, and we're in very muddy soil. We still are not able to get um, as much uh, moisture, uh, not moisture, uh, air as we need for gas exchange. Uh, so what do we do? We use straws. Uh, so these are pneumatophores. Um, and if you look at the picture on the right, you can actually trace um, the way the roots are. You can actually see the roots um, that are underground by looking at where these pneumatophores are. And these are literally straws about the size of like a chapstick. Um, and they have little lenticels. So on the picture on the left, you can see um, the little, little pores. Um, and so those allow for greater gas exchange. So like you can think um, with this uh, wet waterlogged soil, you're able to actually stick your straw up and get some, some gas exchange going on so you can get your essential nutrients. Um, and so these lenticels cells are super cool um, because if you look at this, it's a very, very spongy tissue. Um, again, not the size of the chapstick. And you can see the little uh, uh, cell, the gaps there. Um, and so you can see from uh, left to right, um, we've got a lenticel just starting to form near E. And then that LC, we're starting to get a bigger lenticel. And then finally, with that CO all the way on the right, that's a fully formed lenticel. Um, it's got a greater surface area to uh, for more gas exchange so the plant can breathe, uh, even when soil is flooded. 
So that's pretty cool, but it gets even better. Uh, my favorite mangrove trait, my favorite adaptation, what really turned me on to them uh, is the way that they reproduce, right? So a lot of plants, um, they literally just throw things to the wind uh, and let things happen. Um, so you can have male and male plants with male flowers, female plants with female flowers. You can have a plant with male and female. You can have the same plant, have the same flower. Mangroves are hermaphrodites, so they really just do whatever they want. Um, and so once they are pollinated and they develop um, the seeds, typically plants will either just develop the seeds in like a pod, if you think about legumes or like um, some of the rose families, so like apples and pears, they develop a fruit. Um, mangroves, <laughs> they, don't, they don't need any of that excess dispersal stuff going on. Uh, they are viviparous, meaning they give live birth. Um, so after they're pollinated, they will kind of develop a small fruit, but as you can see, um, the plant starts to develop while still attached to its mother plant. Um, and so you've got this, this big propagula, probably about like uh, maybe a foot to about two feet long. Um, and they'll start developing on the plant, the denser on the bottom. Uh, and so they're able to grow and develop and uh, store a lot of this energy. The green is photosynthetic, so they are able to um, generate their own energy. Uh, and they're kind of relatively protected from the sea elements because they're on the mother, you know, like any good mother does, um, they take care of their youth. Um, and so this happens for a few months. And then at the end of it all, um, like any good mother does, uh, the mangroves, uh, I drop them in the ocean and tell them good luck. Uh, so these, these little uh, propules uh, will float around for like up to a year sometimes, um, just kind of searching around for like a uh, good environment to grow in. Um, sometimes they will fall and land right in the mud. So like black mangroves, et cetera. Um, they'll just kind of land right next to the mother and be like, hey, I'm going to chill here for the rest of my life. Um, and so they'll start developing roots. So you can see that kind of on the right side of that image there. Um, you've got some, some root development going on. Um, there are some ideas out there about like maybe they're, they're sideways at first and then as they reach maturity or a place to grow, they'll change their density and kind of go this way. I haven't been able to find any scientific surfaces. If you find some, please send them my way. I would love to see them, um, but we're not quite sure if that's what's going on. Uh, really what it is is that dense bottom is allowing them to kind of float around until they get lodged in mud either due to storm surge or, or low tide, et cetera. But once they do lodge themselves in the mud after like a year or so of searching around, um, they'll just hang out and then more mangroves will gather. So on the left, you can see we've got a nice little trio starting to grow. Um, and then on the right, we've got a whole like a group of mangroves growing together, starting to form an island like the one you see in the background on the left. And so this is kind of how land reclamation happens. These mangroves will float around in these little pods, stick together, they'll stick in the, the mud or the, or the sand or the silt. Um, and then they'll just kind of grow and develop into an island that is able to support all sorts of wildlife. Um, so first off, like we got that chital up there. It's kind of like a deer relative uh, living amongst those uh, pneumatophores. We've got some monkeys in the bottom left. Uh, we've got a crab. Uh, we've got some, some oysters. We've got sharks in the top, all right? We've got manatees and sea cows. And then, oh, what's that? A Bengal tiger. Yeah, Bengal tigers live in mangroves. They live in mangrove forests. That's over in Bangladesh in the Sundarbans. Um, so, so just another example why that place, these are such cool plants. Um, so they support a huge diversity of life. They, they support uh, different types of otters. There's some dolphins actually that live in mangroves. Um, super cool stuff. Uh, and so it's one thing to look at these pictures and be like, oh, okay, it, it supports a lot of life. It's another thing to be a scientist and write a paper about it. So this is my favorite paper ever. Um, and it's titled, very uh, aptly, Mangroves Enhance the Biomass of Coral Reef Fish Communities in the Caribbean. All right, so some things. First off, uh, yes, small sample size. They only had six different uh, sites that they sampled from. But if you're thinking about setting up, um, what they did to set this experiment up is that they had um, coral reefs. They had like three coral reefs, three coral reefs. These three had mangrove forests associated with them, and these three did not. So if you think about it, in the whole wide universe, you just heard that whole talk about how it's difficult to find a planet supporting Earth life. Now try to go find a planet that has mangroves and coral reefs and, and find one. So in the whole universe, this is kind of where we were able to, and this is in Belize, uh, not we, but uh, the scientist Mumby in, in 2004, this paper has like a thousand citations. Um, they were able to 
um, find a latitudinally uh, discrete sort of uh, way to sample these these mangrove communities. Um, so we can see uh, the ones with the on the left photo, we've got the fishes are the ones without mangroves but still have a reef, and the ones with the trees, those um, do have mangrove forests and coral reefs. And the whole lifestyle strategy here of these young fishes that uh, live in the, the reefs is the born in seagrass. So we're going all the way to the photo on the right there. Um, so they're born into seagrass and they hide out in the seagrass till they get big enough. Um, so they're hiding from predators and they get too big to hide anymore, so they've got to move on. Um, so the ones that have mangroves nearby will go straight into the mangroves and they'll hide out from the predators they will develop until they go into the patch reefs or isolated uh, coral reef patches. The ones without mangroves, they just got to go straight to the coral reef patches and fend for themselves. Um, they don't want to be bigger fish there and they will get eaten. Um, and that is evidenced by the lower biomasses of these, uh, this is just one species, but they, the supplementary information had so much stuff with that. Um, and so without mangroves, these fish, when they finally get to the, the fore reef, the big reef, um, they uh, have, without mangroves, a much lower biomass um, than the reefs that had mangroves to kind of support this, this successional, this lifestyle of these fishes. Um, and so I'm about to throw tons of numbers at you, just bear with me. Um, so first off, to do this, they sampled 100,000 individual fish. I've never seen, I, I cannot even fathom 100,000 individual fish at one time. Uh, I, I do not know, they, they just had a lot of dedication for this. And it was 164 different species. Um, and so then if you look at this little uh, table right here, the important things are the things that are highlighted. So we've got our biomass increases and our significant factors. If you're unfamiliar with significant factors, that is like a statistical term that's uh, used when you do statistics with science to be like, yes, this is a naturally occurring phenomenon backed up by statistics. It's not anecdotal. It's not a one-off. This is something that actually exists. Um, and so if we look at these factors, M is going to mean that the mangroves were um, the significant factor. So the mangroves are the reason why there was a, a biomass increase. Uh, R is going to be the reef was a reason. Uh, S is going to be the site, the specific like island was a reason. And then NS means there was no significance. So there were two instances of no significance here. But of the rest of the fish that they looked at, um, at least for these selected species, and the, again, supplemental information had all so much data. Um, there's only two other instances. There's the, the O. Christosaurus in the patch reef, um, and then we've got the Elipodus in the Mont Ma Montastreo reef um, that did not have mangrove significance. All the other sites had significant factors that were mangroves. So the mangroves were the reason for the fish biomass increase. And in some cases, that was up to 2,600% biomass increase of fish. That's wild for, for, for one specific thing to be the reason why there's 2,600% more of another thing. That is insane, especially if we think about evolution, how millions of years, throughout millions of years, these organisms have grown to depend on each other to, to grow in this such a manner. Um, so, so even beyond that, if we start thinking about, all right, so there's more fish now, what could, does that do for us? Well, one, people eat fish. So like, Mangoes are important for uh, diets. Um, and so we look at ecosystem services. Um, these are gonna be things that uh, supply value to like humans, um, economically sort of thing. Um, often you can think about these like uh, pollinators. Uh, pollinators are a huge ecosystem service. Without pollinators, uh, our food system would not exist today because there's just, we don't have the time to go hand pollinate and everything. Um, so some of the services that mangoes provide, we've got barrier islands, they provide a wind and water break, they immobilize sediment and pollutants to the crop roots, things get trapped there. Um, they create land, as I've talked about earlier. They sequester carbon 10 times as efficient as land forests do, first off, all right? Um, and they have a huge cultural impact. There's like a temple in India that was built um, around this mangrove, uh, this specific mangrove there. Um, it, this provides a livelihood for people. 2.5 million people live near the Sunderbans. Um, that, is, that is children play amongst mangroves. Um, the entire communities live and die by these mangroves. Um, there's also ecotourism. Um, so that's where um, people go. They pay money to go on vacation, to go visit an environmentally, uh, natural environment site. Um, and so you're bringing money into an economy because people want to go experience this wildlife. When they experience this wildlife, they have a better appreciation for it. Um, and then the people who, who are getting the money to, to show the people of wildlife, they have a better appreciation because now like that supports uh, their, their livelihoods. Um, so these are super important trees. Um, so naturally, 
as, as, as we all want to do as humans, we tend to screw up. Uh, yes, this is the Sundervins. Yes, this is the place where the Bengal tiger lives and 2.5 million other people live. Uh, yes, this is an oil spill. Uh, this happened on December 9th, 2014. It's some mud here and some crabs here. Um, and there was a, a spill. There was a, a tanker that crashed in, uh, another boat crashed into the tanker um, and they spilt uh, 350,000 liters of oil. Um, you can see it all along these mangroves here. You can see like the different tides. You can see uh, that the oil is sticking there. Um, at the time, the shipping minister said there would be no major impacts from the oil spill. Yet there, there was endangered dolphins. Yeah, they got a little screwed over. Uh, the endangered otters, they got screwed over. The humans that touched the oil, yeah, their hair fell out. Um, so, so major impact, I don't know, man. Um, but this is, again, this is a one-off thing. These oil spills don't happen every day. When they do happen, it's a huge issue. Um, but it's one of those things where it's like, all right, we, we need to make sure they don't happen. We should probably not be uh, shipping oil through a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Or if we are, we need to have a little bit more precautions in place so we don't spill oil everywhere. Um, so beyond just oil spills messing with everything, um, there's other threats to mangroves. Uh, deforestation, either for aquaculture, so like, like uh, artificial fish or shrimps, which is weird because mangroves support fish biomass, as we know. Why would we get rid of them for that? Um, uh, agriculture, so a lot of that's going to be rice, so you think rice patties, um, palm oil, and it's, to me it's weird to think about evolutionary adaptations over millions of years, these plants have converged on these traits because of the environment that they're in, and now we're cutting them all down and putting something that didn't evolve for that, um, yes, we can do that, but the upkeep is going to be way more than just letting it be, um, and uh, harnessing the, the natural biomass of fish and the, the natural benefits that we get from mangroves, uh, rather than just putting rice or whatever, and then climate change. Uh, the big thing with climate change is sea level rise, uh, specifically with mangroves. They can weather a storm. They're, they're pretty hardy um, plants in that aspect, but uh, if they uh, lentils get covered up, they're, they're going to drown. They're going to die, and then all of a sudden we've got a bunch of dead trees everywhere, uh, and, and that's not super useful because it's not like the lumber wood, etc. Um, so here's a study um, from Richard and Frias, published in 2016. Um, shows land use of deforested mangrove patches in 2012. It's important to note. The study actually was conducted from the year 2000 to 2012. So over those 12 years, um, we can see how uh, mangrove land was changed. Uh, up to 20% of mangrove loss at individual sites over those 12 years. And where is this? Oh yeah, the hot spot of mangrove biodiversity. So that's cool. Uh, and it's only gotten a bit worse since then. Um, so, so lots of issues uh, regarding uh, protecting these wonderful trees. Um, and so like, what can we do? How can we as humans help out these plants that are probably miles and miles away from us if we're uh, not in their uh, actual range? Um, watch what you eat. Uh, if you're going to eat fish, uh, shrimp, get it from a sustainable source. Again, this can be done sustainably with mangroves in the picture. We don't need to remove mangroves. Um, boat, um, this, this is important uh, and I'm not, it, you just think about the environment when you go to vote. Uh, think about the effects on your environment. Uh, earlier this year in the United States, um, some water protection rules uh, were uh, removed um, because people don't understand how watersheds work. Um, everything is connected with watersheds. Every, every, all that, uh, the drain from up here in Wisconsin goes all the way down the Mississippi to where these mangroves are. And if we're not protecting our streams and rivers, um, even if they are directly connected or not directly connected, if we don't protect our waterways, it's going to have drastic impacts on our ecosystem. Um, the unvoting, uh, donate. I understand there that times are tough. I understand that there are bigger fish to fry quite literally right now with this virus. Um, but, but keep in mind some of these organizations so like the Global Mangrove Alliance, Mangrove Action Project, Mangrove Watch, um, some of these different organizations that help reforce mangroves, that help educate people about mangroves, that conserve mangroves. Um, make sure you support those organizations so that way uh, these wonderful trees can still live. And then lastly, learn. By you listening to me uh, gush about these trees tonight, you have already done a huge part because now you actually know about mangroves. You know some of the issues. And as humans, we can't make a difference if we don't know things. So please continue to educate yourselves, continue to learn new things, um, continue to be active on those things uh, because that's the only way that we're gonna make the world a better place. So that is all I have. So thank you very much. Oh man, Tyler. Jeez, take a drink. Yeah. Wow, that's uh, wow. That was so fun. It's so fun to hear it the second time. <laughs> it uh, was very enjoyable. Um, to all you uh, watching on Facebook Live, drop some questions in the comments. We'd be happy to ask them. 
Um, someone named Ashley Wintermute, I would guess possibly related to you, said that she remembers you raving about the study the last time you were home, your favorite study of all time, which made me wonder how often do you rave about that study? And if you could just give us like a, like a monthly average, maybe that would you know, uh, help us understand. It's definitely at least once a month. Even even in my classes, I'll be like, I'll put up like, this is how you do a study. This is this is what it is. So it's definitely at least on a monthly basis. That's that's good. I like that. Uh, at the very beginning, Carnes uh, asked if there are mangroves in Wisconsin. Someone was able to jump on. I explained, no, there are not. But I think that's a good uh, like setup to how you ended up studying uh, botany at UW Madison. Oh my gosh. All right. So my family has a green thumb going back multiple generations, going back to like a farm in Wisconsin at one point, I think. I grew up outside DC, so way far away. Um, and so I just got interested in plants just through my family. I realized this is something I love. My undergrad institution in, in Indiana, uh, I did a bunch of chemistry research on uh, ionization techniques with mass spectrometry with chemicals in cottonwoods. And that kind of led me here to Wisconsin, where it's really a chemical ecology hotspot. Um, and plants are just a vector of that, so. Awesome, awesome. Um, Tabitha Faber, I think I'm pronouncing that right, <clears throat> mentioned, uh, she was asking, do all mangrove species have live birth, even though there are so many different orders? Um, so um, I believe most of them do. There are some like the fern cannot, cannot, support, cannot support that sort of stuff. Um, but the vast majority do. You are still able to get mangrove seeds and like just the seeds are able to be planted, um, but left to their own devices, they will develop into, into a propagule, as far as I know. Okay, okay. Uh, I think that's a good segue to a question that comes from Gurney Oster. I might be pronouncing that incorrectly, uh, and also relates to our previous talk. Can we put mangroves into a spaceship and go to a new planet? Like, what would be the best way for us to do that? All right, so, so putting mangroves into a spaceship, first off, I would prioritize something that uh, has like, I don't know, agriculture. I don't want, I love plants, so I don't want to like dog on any plants, but like there are probably better plants to put into a spaceship besides mangroves. Mangroves are very specialized to their estuarine environments. And outside of those, they don't really offer much. They're very tight grown a few in my day. They're very time intensive. You've got to add salt at the right times. You got to get them right temperature. Um, there are much easier plants to grow. However, yeah, we if, if a plant's going to grow, it can grow in space. It might be a little wonky. There's some astrobotany people looking at gravitropism and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So it might be a little wonky at first, but honestly, so long as you're providing plants the right environment, they do not care. They have no really wants or needs. It just kind of happens for them. So. They just kind of I, I would pick something else first though before. Yeah. Okay, that's good. That's 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 very kind of thoughtful. They're prioritizing those things. Um, uh, this is a question that comes from Gabby Barrio. Barrio, maybe. Uh, I read a poem once about a mangrove that never roots. Is that fact or fiction? Um, so that's what we call a dead tree. Um, <laughs> they, if it doesn't root, it's it's going to die. Um, unless they found it on its year-long voyage in the ocean, it was just kind of going to its next uh, dealio. Um, but otherwise, you it probably didn't have the right nutrients or environment or dehydration level to, to root. Okay. Sorry. okay. It's probably okay. dead. <laughs> so I think I got one more question and then we'll, we'll pass it off. I'm, I see Matt's going to be jumping on here. I remember very specifically because I wrote it down because I thought it was such a great line. Uh, when you presented it in Madison in January, you called the mangrove a charismatic tree. And I'm wondering, if the mangrove were a famous TV character, who would it be? Oh, that's a difficult question. I don't know. I don't know if I have a good answer to that. Mm. Um, I have no idea. Um, it's definitely, it would definitely be someone who could fill multiple roles. Um, mm. It would definitely be a loving person because it does harbor tons of other life. Um, mm -hmm. And it definitely would be resilient um, because I mean, hello, hurricanes, tsunamis, and these things mm -hmm. lived like, mm -hmm. mm, I, I don't know of one character though that, that would uh, encapsulate a mangrove. Uh, just because it's too, just so too much depth. bizarre. You can't, you, can't, you can't capture that in, no. in a human. That's why we need mangroves. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> that works. Well, awesome. Thank you so much, Tyler. Thank you for um, having me. I know it was fun for me. I feel very selfish because I just enjoyed it so much, but I got to see all the like, the Facebook gasps and reactions uh, as people are presenting. Um, so yeah, totally, uh, totally fun to hear this again. Thank you again. And I think we'll pass it back to Matt.
Awesome. Yeah, Thank you for I having me. If, um, yeah, thanks, Tyler. I think if uh, Mangroves were a movie, maybe it would be Roots. Does, does that work? I like that. I like that. I, that, that kind of works. That works, yeah. All right, well, uh, we'll end up with that. All right, thanks. Okay, so we're going to uh, switch over to, uh, to Nerd Night Lawrence here, uh, home of lovely uh, Kansas University. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about cult cinema. And not necessarily a, uh, a cinema segue here, but I do have a cult joke uh, for everyone that is stolen uh, or 100% attributed to my friend George, who is a Nerd Night New York regular. So uh, everyone, uh, Andy, Satya, play along here. Uh, why are there no good jokes about the Jonestown massacre? Why? Why? Because the punchline's too long. <laughs> God. Yeah. Um, on that note, Matt, thank you for segueing into, into Nerd Night Lawrence. Um, hi, everybody from Lawrence, Kansas. Whoever wants to do a little bit of research can read about Bleeding Kansas. Um, I actually, uh, when Derek was talking, Nerd Night Orlando's Derek, um, I just did a quick Google search and I realized that the guy who discovered Pluto is from Lawrence. His name is Clyde Palmo. Oh, by the way, shout out to my fellow co bosses, uh, Jason, um, who's known as the comedy mayor, Elliot, the boy nerd genius, and Jesse, who gets shit done. And here I am proving I'm more than the token female of the group. Um, um, someone else who's from Lawrence is Langston Hughes, and um, segueing into literary types, we have our very own Andrew Farkas. Um, Andy, actually, um, we know him from board games because he plays. He's an avid board gamer, but when he's not playing board games, his day job uh, uh, or his life is he's the author of the novel *The Big Red Herring*. Um, for those of you who love uh, Welcome to Night Whale, he started writing this, um, he started writing uh, about this way before Night Whale. Um, he has two collections of short fiction, self-titled Debut and Sun Sphere. They're amazing if you have a chance to read them. He's also the fiction editor for The Rupture, and he's an assistant professor of English at Washburn University. In true professorial fashion, he will not have a presentation, so all of us can focus on Andrew talking about cult cinema. Take it away. Thank you very much, Satya. Uh, yes, so uh, this is my first time presenting uh, at Nerd Night. Uh, so uh, the one downside, I suppose, is I have no visuals this time. Uh, so you can just uh, sit back uh, and drink with whomever uh, lives in your place with you. Uh, and pretend like you're listening to a podcast as I talk about uh, cult movies. Uh, so I'm going to start off by talking about my history with cult films. Back in 1994, I went to the Rocky Horror Picture Show for the first time. I had never been to it before, nor had I ever heard of it. Uh, and when I went, uh, I found that my friends who had taken me to it uh, told me nothing at all about it. Uh, and so I had no idea what I was going to see uh, and so what I ended up seeing are uh, people who are dressed like the characters up on the screen, which is something I had never really seen before at a movie. Uh, I realized that people were uh, shouting out a second script that they had memorized. Uh, and normally, of course, going to the movies was always you're silent and unless maybe you are uh, laughing at some joke uh, or maybe you got afraid and so you might have yelled. But for the most part, you were quiet, but not at this movie. Instead, uh, people were uh, saying their own lines. Uh, but also, as I started going more and more, I realized that the same lines were repeated again and again. Uh, and strangely enough, also, a lot of those lines are about the fact that the movie itself was bad. Uh, and so here we were, we were going to a movie that was bad and people were celebrating it by dressing up like the characters, uh, by shouting things out, uh, even by dancing sometimes in the aisles, uh, throwing things in the air, and none of this was like any kind of movie that I had ever been to before. Uh, and if it wasn't obvious enough already by going again and again, the people who performed told you uh, that you are joining a cult, you are joining the Rocky Horror Picture Show cult, 
Uh, and so for a number of years, I was definitely in that cult since I went just about every single week. Although amongst the people that I knew, I did not go the most uh, weeks in a row. A friend of mine went something like 24 weeks in a row, uh, but uh, I went again and again. Uh, and even before the Rocky Horror Picture Show, my dad had taken me to see Army of Darkness, which then got me to see Evil Dead 2, and later on led to me talking to the actor Bruce Campbell on the phone for a while. Uh, and so all of this is my background in cult cinema, but like I put in the description for this talk, uh, there are so many different kinds of movies that are considered cult movies uh, you get to wonder what exactly is a cult movie? How can we define them? Uh, and is there any way that we can define them? Uh, so the first definition that I'm going to uh, give is uh, perhaps the simplest one. And that is any movie that when it was originally released did poorly at the theater, but later on through uh, midnight showings, uh, through video and now through streaming, uh, gained a cult following. Uh, so that is the first definition, and there are plenty of movies that meet this definition. Uh, movies like Brazil, Harold and Maude, Heathers, The Thing, Highlander, The Big Lebowski, Dread, Fight Club, and Donnie Darko. All of these movies meet this definition for uh, what a cult movie is. Uh, and frequently, uh, these movies became cult movies because they were misunderstood. Uh, for instance, uh, Roger Ebert used to like to talk about how the uh, Night of the Living Dead, which was one of the first midnight movies, uh, how that movie was originally shown at a children's matinee because it was thought to be a kid's movie. And if anybody has seen Night of the Living Dead, uh, yeah, not so much for kids. Uh, but anyway, so they might have been misunderstood, they might have been poorly advertised, they might have come out at an unfortunate time, like Donnie Darko came out around uh, the time of 9-11, uh, or they might have just been ahead of their time, or uh, the studio might have been afraid for some reason of the movie and uh, they butchered it. And so the movie that was released to the theater wasn't actually the movie the director intended. And so the biggest example of that is Brazil, where Terry Gilliam ended up taking out a full page ad uh, in the newspaper in order to uh, try to get the studio to put out the version of Brazil that he intended uh, everyone to see. So that is one definition of what uh, a cult film is. But that's really kind of the easiest one because you can make various arguments for how these movies are good. Uh, it's just something unfortunate happened. And so consequently, uh, it didn't quite reach, each movie didn't quite reach the audience that it needed. Uh, and it found it later on. And if that audience would have been able to get to the movie uh, when it was originally released, then maybe it wouldn't have done poorly in the first place. Uh, so that is one, uh, that is one definition. Uh, but getting into the more difficult definition, uh, we can think of movies that are just really, really, really bad. And so if we think about really, really, really bad movies, we wonder why anybody would go to see them. Uh, these are movies like Reefer Madness, uh, where I'm fairly certain that no one who made the movie uh, had ever gotten high and definitely didn't know anyone who had. Uh, Plan 9 from Outer Space, The Room, Manos, The Hands of Fate, Birdemic, some uh, more recent ones there. Uh, but these movies are really awful, uh, and so we wonder why anybody would see them. So for my students, what I normally do is I draw a diagram uh, and I think that I invented this diagram, but I am perfectly fine with uh, the idea that somebody else may have invented it, and I just don't know who got to it before me. Uh, but I draw a check mark, and at the highest point of the check mark, I put great movies. At the lowest point of the check mark, I put mediocre movies. And at the second highest point, I put 
awful movies. Now that seems strange, perhaps, uh, because one would think that a mediocre movie would be better than an awful movie. Uh, and so normally what I do is I ask the students why it would be that an awful movie is perhaps better than a mediocre movie. Uh, and the argument that I make is that awful movies stick with us far longer than mediocre movies. Because if you go and see a mediocre movie, you watch it, it plays, you recognize what's going on, the actors are fine, the camera work is fine, everything is fine. And then afterwards, you go away from it, uh, or if you were watching it on your TV, you shut the TV off, and probably you will never think about that movie again. And if somebody says, have you seen this movie? And they say some mediocre movie, your response will probably be, yeah, it was all right, but that's all. But terrible movies have a different power. Uh, and the terrible movie that I am going to use in particular here is Plan 9 from Outer Space. Plan 9 from Outer Space, uh, watching it, you have the feeling that everybody who worked on it was incompetent. They had no idea what they were doing, but they were so bad at what they were doing that what they were doing sticks with us. Uh, and by viewing a movie like this, it ends up making us wonder what it is that makes a movie good and what it is that makes a movie bad. And I would say that my short answer for what makes a movie good frequently is a kind of naturalism. We get caught up in the world, we get caught up in the characters, and even though we know, for instance, that people can't fly and that uh, we don't have space empires, that uh, people are shooting at each other in space wars, all of it seems kind of believable. Whereas watching something like Plan 9 from Outer Space, you don't believe in any of it at all. But there is a different way to approach this. And it is to say that any movie that you are watching, unless you're watching documentaries, granted, but any movie that you are watching, no matter how natural it is, well, it's still fictional. It doesn't matter how much you believe in it. It's still not real. And so we can take a different approach uh, to bad movies, and that is called the paracinematic approach. In the paracinematic approach, uh, instead of looking at bad movies as everybody was incompetent and there were constant mistakes and errors in the making, we think to ourselves that all of that stuff was done on purpose. And if you think about it like that, if you think about a bad movie, but instead say all of this was done on purpose, it becomes a completely different viewing experience. And what I compare it to is I compare it to two different styles of acting and production. One of them is the Stanislavski method, which is the naturalist method. That's the one where actors uh, go out and if you're playing, for instance, a police detective, you go and you hang out with a bunch of police detectives, you find out how they act, you find out what their world is like, uh, but uh, then you take all of that with you and put it into your performance. On the other hand, there is Bertolt Brecht. Bertolt Brecht uh, developed something called epic theater. Epic theater was not interested in making you fall for an illusion. And in fact, Brecht did whatever he could to remind you that you were watching a play. Well, we can say that the paracinematic approach does something similar to that. And so when you are watching uh, Plan 9 from Outer Space, you might ask yourself why it is that Ed Wood chose to do all of these things that call attention to themselves. For instance, at one point in the movie, characters are walking through a graveyard and the gravestones are very obviously made of cardboard. Uh, at another point in the movie, a police detective pulls out his gun and continues to just wave his gun around as if it were a pointer 
or as if it were something that would just be normally carried around like that at all times, even scratching his head with his gun at one point. And so we ask ourselves, why would Ed Wood uh, do something like this? Well, when we get to the aliens in the movie, the aliens point out to us that humans are extremely violent and they are so violent that after developing the best nuclear weapons, perhaps they are going to go on and develop a weapon that could destroy entire planets in one go. And they are so terrified that humans are going to do this. Aliens have come to do whatever they can to stop us uh, from developing that weapon. But at one point, uh, we have a character who starts shouting that humans are stupid. They are stupid, 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 he shouts. Now, normally we would just think that this is bad writing. And yes, the acting isn't particularly good uh, if we are thinking of the Stanislavski method. So we would think about this as bad acting and bad writing. Uh, and then of course, bad set design since they are hanging out in a place that looks like all of the generic science fiction stuff that's in the background of 1950s science fiction movies happens to be sitting there. Uh, well, uh, we can think to ourselves about this character who is shouting about humans are stupid. And then, as I think, uh, I think about the many works of art, literature and film that were anti-war, anti-violence. They were very intelligent about their themes they are very intelligent about the way they go uh, about getting across their ideas. And yet, war continues on and violence continues on. And so all of that subtlety, perhaps it isn't working. And instead we need something extremely blunt. And so instead of telling us something in a way that is very subtle and requires us to think about it, instead it is ham-fisted and nothing in the movie is believable because he does not want you to get caught up in this illusion. Now, is this the case? Was this what Ed Wood was doing? No, uh, but the paracinematic approach is not interested necessarily in what uh, the director was originally doing. Instead, this is a tactic uh, when it comes to our viewing and it is one reason uh, why we can view bad movies uh, because we can bring our own ideas to them and change what is being delivered to us. Uh, so that is my talk about paracinema, uh, but there are other things to say about cult movies. Another thing to say uh, is that a lot of cult movies uh, do things that Hollywood will not necessarily do or won't do until after cult movies have done them they have become kind of popular. Uh, and so consequently, uh, things become accepted uh, and then Hollywood films do them later on. For instance, think about uh, a movie like uh, Reservoir Dogs, which is still considered a cult movie, even though uh, Tarantino is certainly accepted in mainstream Hollywood by now. But Reservoir Dogs, uh, even though it is a jewel heist movie to a certain extent, never shows us the jewel heist. And so cult films are perfectly fine with giving you these loose ends, letting you uh, think about what might have happened without actually showing it to you. Uh, another thing is that a lot of times Hollywood films, in order to be uh, advertised more easily, well, they try to stick them into particular categories. That's not necessarily the case with cult films. Uh, and so in cult films, you frequently get genre hybridity. For instance, there's a movie called Bubba Hotep, which is all at the same time, a cheesy horror film, an absurdist comedy, a Western, and a relatively realistic portrayal of a retirement home. Uh, all of these things collide together in the film and somehow they just work, even though Hollywood would not have done it that way. And in fact, Ebert's review uh, of Bubba Hotep, he is very obviously confused and cannot believe that all of these things came together. 
Uh, something else is intertextuality. Uh, cult films are frequently perfectly fine with letting you know what their uh, uh, influences are. So for instance, the movie Brazil, Terry Gilliam said that originally he was going to call it 1984 and a half because it was a combination of the novel 1984 and also a combination uh, of Fellini's movie Eight and a Half. And he wanted to bring those two things together and he brought it together in Brazil, uh, which watching the movie, you can very much tell. Uh, something else is transgression. Uh, frequently things that are not necessarily acceptable, well, they are put into cult movies. So for instance, in Harold and Maud and Heathers, the treatment of suicide in those two movies is not exactly what we would expect. In fact, uh, there are jokes about suicide in each of those movies, uh, and there is a very like dark view of these things, but darkly comic a lot of the time. Uh, and then there is gore. Uh, and even a movie like The Wizard of Gore, Herschel Gordon Lewis directed that, uh, even a movie like The Wizard of Gore, even though it's a very low budget movie, the fact that it just uses so much gore does end up having this power over you. And other movies that aren't actually all that gory uh, can get uh, a reputation as being gory, like the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, uh, that, if you go back and watch it, actually doesn't have all that much gore in it, but people think it does and they imagine it does, so they continue to say that it does have all of this gore. Uh, one more thing that I wanna bring, bring up uh, is to complicate matters even more, sometimes movies that are actually really popular are also considered cult movies. Uh, so movies like Star Wars, The Wizard of Oz, which The Wizard of Oz was originally like a failure, but then it was re-released by the studio and then it became a success. Uh, the Lord of the Rings, The Matrix, movies like these are like did pretty well at the box office, uh, depending which movie we're talking about, uh, but are also considered cult movies because of the way they are celebrated. Remember earlier, I was talking about the Rocky Horror Picture Show and just about every time I've gone, people have been dressed up like the characters. Well, that is the case with these movies too. And there are others that are like this uh, with The Big Lebowski having Lebowski Fest. The Big Lebowski, on the other hand, was not originally a popular movie, but now it, it is an extremely popular movie, even outside uh, of the cult film uh, uh, community. Uh, and so the way these movies get celebrated is very different than, for instance, if you saw uh, a showing of the Maltese Falcon, for instance, it is highly unlikely that people would start yelling at the screen uh, or would be dressed up like characters in the film, maybe, but it's not an absolute compared to the other movies that I just listed. So this celebration uh, of the movie in a very different way, uh, well, that leads us uh, to how people think about these movies. Uh, and it seems like cult movies invite a kind of deep dive in a way that sometimes mainstream movies do not. And so I figure that's what being a nerd is all about. Uh, is being willing to do the deep dive and not really caring uh, if anybody sees just how much you are into this topic, whether they are or not. Well, that's my talk. Uh, the podcast, uh, my part of the, the podcast alone is now over. <laughs> that was brilliant, Andy. Kind of makes me think I'm, I've been wasting my life watching the wrong set of movies. And actually your discussion <laughs> has sparked like a little cinematic movie club in the comments um, and I can't read all of them but some very great like trivia uh, that's been popping up in the comments oh, we have a question from Martha hi Martha um, the question is is there any correlation between the paracinematic approach and kfab or kfab I don't know I'm not cultured enough to know what that is um, I, I admit I am not either, I guess, because uh, I, I do not know it, uh, but uh, I'm, I would love to learn about it. <laughs> um, okay, um, I guess we can circle back on that later when we all meet up in, in Lawrence. 
Um, <laughs> Hannah has a question and she says, uh, Hannah Lee has a question. She says, how does the Paris cinematic view of the film apply to the Rocky Horror Picture Show, given the film is pretty faithful to the stage show and which came first? Um, also, I have to let you know that she says she's watched it over 25 times in the theater, so we better answer it factually. <laughs> Our reputation's on the line. So the uh, the play, uh, so the the musical play came first, definitely, uh, and that was uh, really successful. Uh, the movie, however, was not, uh, and the movie, like even though it has Tim Curry in it. Uh, so he does a good job. Uh, definitely there are like problems with the movie because it was, I mean, it had an okay budget, but not still not a great budget. Uh, and so consequently there are like mistakes that are made throughout the movie. Uh, and that's one of the things that people do when they are shouting things at the screen is they make fun of various things that, you know, are on, you know, the screen that shouldn't be there. Uh, and so consequently, uh, I would say that, yes, it sticks to the play and the play is uh, like has an irony to it. Uh, but I feel like uh, the stuff where people are making fun of the movie, uh, most of the stuff that they are making fun of is, you know, the fact that the movie wasn't super, you know, wasn't a, you know, huge budget film. Uh, and so anytime you get like cheaper and cheaper, more and more mistakes are going to appear. That isn't to say there aren't any mistakes in big budget things, uh, big budget pictures, but there definitely uh, are more in smaller budget pictures. Okay, that was, I hope that was a satisfying response. Hey, I want to circle back to Martha's question. Um, now I know a little bit more. Kesabe is a wrestling term that it, it's like pretending that this word of make believe is real. Um, and so, Basically, what is the basically a question was about the Paris cinematic approach um, between um, Kate Fabe and uh, correlation between pa the Paris cinematic approach and Kate Fabe. Um, I so the thing is though is that I I feel like now that I uh, now that you said uh, professional wrestling now I remember that uh, term and I would I would say that. Uh, with Paris cinema, it's all on the viewers. Uh, so, for instance, Ed Wood really thought that he was making a Stanislavski method kind of movie. Uh, and he was positive that, you know, everything that he was doing was going to turn out, you know, like a movie like he enjoyed. Uh, and it just turns out that he was not a particularly skilled filmmaker. Uh, and I feel like Tim Burton makes fun of that in the movie about Ed Wood. Uh, but uh, I, I would say consequently, like the people, the wrestlers know what's going on. Uh, and so they have like the double consciousness about it where they're pretending, but at the same time, uh, they're like projecting that this is real. Whereas uh, uh, Paracinema is definitely about the viewers and bringing a different uh, approach to uh, movies that many people consider bad. That answered Martha's question. Hey, um, I think we have time to slip in one quick question. It's probably a yes or no. You can expound if you like. So Faye um, asked, would you say Fight Club is a cult movie? So it's it didn't do super well immediately. Uh, and so it picked up later on. And so in that way it is. Uh, and then like there are lots of other things that we can bring to it because it isn't always the fact uh, it isn't always a fact that uh, uh, cult movies did poorly at the theater originally. Uh, it was sometimes it's just later on people uh, got into watching them again and again. Uh, so the one thing that I would say about uh, Fight Club is that it's extremely quotable uh, and it's quotable in a way that many cult films are. Awesome. I think we're going to be played off the stage. Hey, I just want to give a shout out saying keep your ear out for Easter eggs for Alvar Talk and Kevin Garcia. He's promised to mention a few things. All right. Um, thank you, everybody. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. First rule of nerd night, there is no nerd night. Uh, there are actually 100 nerd nights globally. Surprise. That's why we're here tonight. That's my smooth segue. All right. We reached the halfway point of the second. Uh, no, not even annual second semi-monthly nerd night nerdathon. 
want to learn a little bit about uh, some of the treasures lurking in the Marvel Disney universe. So uh, let's pass it over to the good folks at Nerd Night Austin. Uh, Amy, go ahead, take it away. Outstanding. So greetings from Nerd Night Austin, which is a multi-boss endeavor involving Aaron, Mickey, Jacob, Bianca, Jacqueline, Shelby, and me. Amy. Uh, we just had our 124th show, give or take a few special editions, and our 124th show was our first virtual show, so we're practically pros at this. Um, our speaker tonight is Kevin Garcia, and he's going to be talking about Marvel Underground, What Disney Doesn't Know It Owns. And Kevin's a certified educator and professional writer whose work has appeared in the AP and Marvel Comics. You are in for a treat. Take it away, Kevin. Salutations. My name is Kevin Garcia, and I am a professional comic book educator. Wait, that's not right. Current professional comic book historian. Uh, I've actually been paid to read comic books by Marvel. I, I've contributed to the official handbook of the Marvel Universe and everything. And today we're going to be looking at the weird and winding world of Marvel's obscure history and some of the stuff that Disney probably doesn't know it bought when it purchased Marvel in 2009. I imagine everyone watching this has heard of the Avengers. Well, before they were box office hits in 1961, uh, Fantastic Four number one kicked off what people really think of as the Marvel Universe. And way before that, in 1939, Marvel Comics number one kicked off the true history of the Marvel Universe. But I'm going to go back even farther than that to back when Marvel was making Pulp Fiction. See, way before they made comics, the company that made Marvel made Pulp. And Pulp magazines were essentially... Uh, really, really cheap paper with really, really cheap stories that would tell, well, cheap stuff. And they could be anything from raunchy romance to sensational sci-fi to wild westerns. And they were combinations of a little bit of art and a lot of prose. Well, these things were being published by a man named Martin Goodman. Martin Goodman is the guy that eventually created Marvel, uh, but he didn't call his company Marvel at first. Uh, he called it Manvis Publishing or Red Circle Magazines or Newsstand Press. He called it many different things, but you might recognize some of his titles because he liked putting Marvel in a lot of them. And he also had stories about characters like the X-Man who was a secret agent that didn't have any powers or the Avengers of Space, which was actually an alien invasion story. Well, not all of his stories are completely forgotten because a lot of them you know, didn't get reprinted. At least one of them is still around to this day. Kazar, and he's a totally original character. See, he was a uh, nobleman who was abandoned in Africa and then raised by animals to become a hero in a loincloth. And, and I know there was that other guy who was you know, raised by apes, but this guy's totally different. Well, anyway, when Goodman decided to transition from pulps into comics, he brought Kazar with him. He had the original writer, Bob Bird, make the comics with the artists and everything. So while pulp was more prose and less art, comics were the other way around. And he liked bringing in stuff from many different characters. So many different places where he'd kind of steal ideas from other places. Copyright was kind of loose back then. There was a hero in the 30s called The Saint who would solve crimes by putting a little uh, logo of a saint behind, kind of leaving his calling card. So Goodman had his people make the angel. And in Marvel Comics number one, Angel showed up and he was basically, what if Batman dressed like Superman? And he'd leave Mark of an Angel behind. Well, this guy went from pulps, sorry, comics to pulps. In 1941, Goodman had him create the Angel Detective, which was essentially the same character, same MO. Of course, he had his on the uh, his angel mark on the butt of his gun. So he would actually bash the bad guys in the head and leave a mark of the Angel Gabriel behind. This was a, a thing for heroes back in those days. They'd leave their calling card whenever they'd murder somebody. Anyway, uh, this brings us to superheroes and Marvel's first comic, Marvel Comics number one. But what's really neat to me is that aside from the Angel and Kazar, some of the characters in this first book weren't even originally in Marvel. See, there's this guy called Namor the Submariner. And well, I imagine everybody now knows Aquaman, right? I hate Aquaman. Aquaman is a ripoff of Marvel's character, Namor the Submariner, who was the first undersea hero. He was also the first superhero to fly under his own power back when Superman was still leaping tall buildings on a single bound. Well, Namor was truly Marvel's first superhero, although Kazar may have been his first regular hero because Namor had all the powers, but he was also Marvel's first supervillain in that he would attack New York City for polluting the ocean and then attack the Nazis for attacking New York City. You know? Well, he first appeared not in Marvel Comics, but in Motion Picture Funnies Weekly, a small comic from another publisher. And he wasn't alone. There was another comic called 
the Amazing Mystery Funnies from Centaur Publications that featured a scientist, his nephew, and their bodyguard, Ken Masters, who's not a street fighter. And the three of them would go on adventures together. Well, these guys also showed up in Marvel Comics number one. See, copyright didn't really apply a lot in that Goodman would just ask writers and artists, bring me your stuff, and they'd bring it. So in the case of Namor and Ken Masters, they would bring it and then just expand on it in this new publication. Of course, superheroes didn't last forever. And uh, by the end of the World War II, the superheroes were kind of on the out. So Goodman had them publish other things, funny animals, horror, sci-fi, whatever. There were also a lot of comics that were aimed at girls and women, which is interesting because a few decades later, the common conventional wisdom was girls don't read comics. And we know for a fact that's not true. But to get an idea of how these things were made, it's, it's a little bit different from what we think of. See, they had this character, Miss America. Now, Miss America was super strong. She had x-ray vision. She could fly all that jazz. But she was in only about a fifth of her original books. See, most of the books was stuff like makeup tips or what to do if Johnny asks you out. And, and I realize that seems kind of antiquated and weird to nowadays. But at the time, readers loved it. They ate it up. They wrote in asking for more. And the most popular part of Miss America was actually a comic strip about teenagers. There was a teenager uh, there was a teenager that had a rich brunette that liked him and also a light-haired girl that was much nicer and also liked him. Yeah, Marvel was ripping off Archie. But in this case, Archie wasn't the main character. Betty was. And Betty's name was Patsy Walker. She took over the book in the sense that by issue three or four, Miss America stopped showing up. And now it was Patsy Walker's book. And it remained that way for the next 20 years. In fact, if you've ever watched Jessica Jones, you've seen Patsy Walker because she's Trish. That's right, Trish is older than most Marvel superheroes, having been around since 1946. Now, while Marvel was making these comics, well, called Timely at those days, it was making comics, Goodman was making other magazines, including Stag magazines. I find these things very interesting. Stag magazines were basically aimed at men, and they had sexist jokes, and they would have lurid tales of of men uh, rescuing women that needed it and that kind of stuff. But what's really neat is a lot of these Stag magazines had these comics in the middle. And they told this story of a character uh, called Pussycat, who was the agent for an acronymed agency called SCORE, and they would fight the enemies of lust. Well, SCORE, the secret council of ruthless extroverts, would send her out, and she was a bubble-headed blonde that didn't know how attractive she was. She would actually solve just about every crime by losing her top, and uh, again, they didn't show anything. What I think is really neat about Pussycat here is that she actually got referenced in a Marvel comic recently. About 10 years ago, there was a Defenders comic where there was a bunch of reality warping. At the bottom of one of the pages, it says, follow the adventures of Pussycat as she fights lust. So she's canon. Good enough for me. Now, by the 50s, Marvel wanted to get back into the superhero game, and they tried, but they weren't as successful as DC. DC Comics was much more successful with their reinvention of Flash and Green Lantern and those other characters. Marvel was stuck doing monster books, which, you know, Stanley and Jack Kirby and those guys enjoyed doing, but they really, really wanted to do superheroes. So they snuck superheroes into their monster books. See, what if, what if you had a teenager who got bit by a creature and that creature transformed him and, and he wore a costume? And that was the birth of the real Marvel universe as we think of it today, but that's not what this talk's about. So let's leave the stuff you know about alone and let's go to the really, really weird stuff. See, Marvel was inspired by other comics and wanted to to do what they were doing. And around this time in the 60s and 70s, underground comics were becoming really big, especially thanks to a guy named R. Crumb. He would do a lot of LSD and draw whatever popped into his head. And it was really, well, it looked like whatever a high guy would do, um, a guy who was high would do. And, And his books had racism and sexism and a lot of stuff, but it was very unfiltered and people read it. Wasn't super financially successful, but definitely got a lot of critical acclaim. So Stan wanted to do this and he created the comics book. You can tell it's serious because they put an X on it. And now comics book had a little bit of Marvel material, but most of the stuff belonged to the creators themselves. And when comics book was not financially successful and they had to cancel it after three issues, Marvel was nice enough to give it to Kitchen Sink Press to finish the last issue. And a lot of these characters and stories continued off in other things. For example, Panthea here is the story of a half woman, half lion. And that's literal because her mother did some freaky stuff. But uh, there were other comics as well, including Barefoots, which got a lot of critical acclaim, and Mouse, which is the first comic to get a Pulitzer Prize. And that first appeared in a Marvel comic. 
Marvel was still doing pulp magazines at this time, although they mixed and matched them with their comics. So they would have a lot of magazines out there and realize that while comic books were hampered by a thing called the Comics Code Authority, which prevented them from showing things like murder and bad guys always had to go to jail and that kind of thing, they realized that if they called it a magazine and not a comic, they could put whatever they wanted in there. Now, you'd think that would mean they do a lot of R-rated stuff, but they kept it PG-13. These ended by the end of the 70s, and in the 80s, they tried to do a few more. For example, Savage Tales uh, included some neat stuff. One of the things in Savage Tales was a comic called The Nam, and it was actually so interesting. Marvel spun it off into its own series. It became critically acclaimed as being the story of just real normal people in the Vietnam War. Uh, no superheroes at all, it, except for the four or five issues where Punisher showed up. Yeah. Uh, the biggest thing Marvel did during this time was Epic. Now, Epic was a magazine where Marvel really tried to push the envelope, going beyond heavy metal, really pushing the envelope on high concept sci-fi. What's really interesting, though, to me is that they'd have Marvel-owned properties like The Last Galactus Story right next to Cerebus by Dave Sims. Now, Dave Sims was an icon, a legend in the indie comics world in that he created what was the longest running comic that was still drawn by its original creator when it ended. And he got a lot of respect un until people realized he was nuts. But, but it's just cool that you have this iconoclastic guy next to an icon like Galactus. Now, Epic transitioned away from being a magazine into being an imprint where Marvel would tell indie creators, okay, you can publish your own magazines. We'll put our name on it and you get to keep the rights. Pretty cool, pretty good deal. But Marvel being Marvel still did some of their own stuff inside of this. So for example, in Epic, you'd find Powerline, which is part of the Shadowline saga, which belonged to Marvel. So it actually showed up later in the Secret Wars storyline. And I know that it belonged to Marvel because of the thing I look for every time I buy an indie book. I'm looking at the indicia. I want to find, I'm wanting to find who owns what, you know? If the creator owns it, they get to keep the rights and go and continue with it elsewhere. But if the company owns it and you sell your company, that means whoever now owns the company owns the rights. And that applies to a lot of what I'm looking at today. For example, there was a company called Amazing that became a company called Pied Piper and they merged with a company called Wonder. And these guys had a super original comic called The X-Mutants. Now, I know what you're thinking, but see, these guys were separated from the rest of humanity by a genetic difference. Uh, they, they protected a world that feared and hated them. But the difference is the world that feared and hated them were a world, world full of mutants. These guys were humans. It was uh, one guy and four hot girls because that's how that works in these comics. And it wasn't super amazing, but one thing I think is kind of neat is that around this time, the X-Men got a spinoff called The New Mutants. So the X-Mutants got a spinoff called The New Humans. Again, very original. Uh, there was another company around this time called Aircell. Now, Aircell had a bunch of really neat comics. These comics would cover neat experimental stuff. I think a little bit above average for a lot of the indie comics of the 80s. Uh, one of the comics that got my attention is this one here. Uh, you'll see in the corner there that has this guy who's the totality of a universe. I don't know the whole story because I only have some of these books, but I do know that this guy would be really amazing in a Doctor Strange storyline. Well, Aircell did a lot of experimental comics. They did color ones, they did black and white ones, some of them that were groundbreaking and some of them that were kind of cringy. Uh, they had these elf comics uh, that you know ranged in quality, they were pretty good. But uh, the elves did have some spinoffs, including this one, which is the only comic that I don't feel comfortable showing a single panel from. I will say I did buy it in Lawrence though, so go Lawrence. Um, <laughs> the point is, Aircell had a lot of cool stuff, including the earliest comics by creator Dale Keown. Now, Dale Keown later got uh, known as one of the best Hulk artists ever, and some of his early books are some of his best art ever. And I really wish Marvel would reprint them because, hey, again, technically, Marvel owns these. Uh, Marvel bought a company that bought a company that bought a company. So Marvel owns this just like they own this. Yeah, Marvel owns Men in Black. And if you watch the movies, it says usually at the beginning, based on the Marvel comic. And this is Kind of true. See, the Men in Black movie had been in the works for years. And by the time it actually got made, Marvel had bought the company who bought the company who bought the company. So actually, it was based on a comic that Marvel just happened to own. It was just one of those things that uh, was good luck on their part. Well, Air Cell and Pied Piper sold themselves to Eternity, which sounds very dramatic. Uh, but Eternity did uh, mostly mostly movie tie-in comics. These were licensed books where they, whenever possible, they'd get permission from the movie studio unless the movie studio didn't own permission, in which case, like Plan 9 here, they just do whatever they wanted with it. Um, and Eternity uh, did some average books. I wouldn't say they were super exciting. 
Uh, but there's another company around this time that I want to talk about called Adventure. They made some above average books, uh, but they didn't last very long either because they, along with Eternity, were purchased by a company called Malibu Comics. Now, Malibu primarily published other people's books, but they did have some of their own. One of their own comics was The Protectors, and this was a comic that was filled entirely with characters that were in the public domain from the Centaur Publications uh, line. Centaur is the same company I mentioned earlier from Ken Masters, who showed up in Marvel Comics number one. Well, they wanted to make themselves a bit distinguished, so they would make really unique covers and they would try to make these covers as unique as possible, including cutting holes into them. See, this was supposed to be the gimmick. A hero dies in this issue, so they have a bullet hole going all the way through. They didn't put very much thought into it though because it cuts into the story and the art and the ads. And in fact, the hero doesn't even get shot. He gets punched to death by a villain named Mr. Monday. Garfield would hate him. They tried the same thing again later with cutting an issue into the shape of a hero's head. Well, Malibu's greatest uh, thing was to try to expand beyond this and merge all these different things. Um, they included something they bought from Eternity called the Dinosaurs for Hire. These were a fourth wall breaking team of dinos that were mercenaries that could be hired, you know, hence the name. Pretty well done, although a lot of sexism at the time again, but, but still well done. Well, the Dinosaurs for Hire and the uh, protectors and the ex-mutants all got merged into the Genesis storyline along with other characters like the dead clown who was a deformed guy that healed really fast and told morbid jokes while killing superheroes. Um, this wasn't super successful, but they next tried something even bigger and that was uh, getting these guys into video games like Dinosaurs for Hire and the ex-mutants. I do want to point out about Dinosaurs for Hire that while they did belong to Malibu at the time, the original creator, Tom Mason, recently applied and got a trademark for his characters. So I guess he got them back. I guess Marvel just didn't care enough to check. Um, that, there goes my plans for a Deadpool Dinosaurs for Hire crossover. Malibu later put out the Ultraverse, which anybody who read comics in the early 90s should be familiar with. These guys were really, really critically acclaimed. They made the some of the great superhero comics of those two years that they published. Uh, Marvel purchased them uh, shortly around that time. So characters like the Lord Pumpkin here, who's essentially Loki if he had a rotting pumpkin for a head, and I, I just think that's amazing, um, got folded into the Marvel Universe, sort of. See, they had this really, really great crossover called the Ultra Force Avengers, written by Warren Ellis and drawn by George Perez. And it did what Marvel promised, bringing a lot of Marvel characters to the Ultraverse, propping up the Ultraverse, but it may never get republished, and I don't know why. See, they shortly afterwards, Ultraverse stopped selling and they stopped publishing them and they stopped making them. And for whatever reason, Marvel's never gone back to them. They haven't republished these characters. They haven't brought them into any other comics. In fact, there was a story recently where Galactus needed the Infinity Jones, uh, Stones and this Ultraverse character called Rune actually had one of the stones. So Galactus stuck his arm through a portal in the reality, pulled out the skeleton of this vampire and took the stone from it. And apparently the original art actually had him looking very much like Rune, but when it published, it was just a generic skeleton. It's like they couldn't even admit he was in the Ultraverse. And honestly, I don't know why. Now there's another company around this time that is not related to any of the other ones that I've been mentioning. And this was CrossGen. Apparently it was a really rich guy who wanted to make his own comic universe, so he just paid a bunch of guys to make it. CrossGen united all their comics by this sigil that gave powers to everyone. It could be a Western or a sword and sorcery or a superhero book, and they'd all be connected in some way. Unlike the Ultraverse, Marvel did bring these guys back recently, publishing new stories about uh, CrossGen characters, taking a little bit of that 90s excess out and making them a little bit more modern. Now, leaving alone stuff that uh, was outside of Marvel, there were things that have always been inside of Marvel but tend to be forgotten. For example, there were international books. Now, originally that meant making very cheap comics with very cheap paper, but Marvel really wanted to push the envelope. And in the seventies, they opened up Marvel UK to make some original comics. That also meant in the eighties that they brought in Alan Moore considered to be one of the greatest comic book writers of all time. But Marvel and DC both pissed him off. So he stopped working for Marvel after a while. Still, while he was there, he created the Fury who was one of the most unbeatable characters to ever show up in a comic book and not be used as part of a major company crossover. Captain Britain for the stories uh, should be showing up in Disney plus soon. So hopefully we'll get to see some fury. I'd love to see it. Now, British publications used a weekly schedule while American ones used a monthly schedule. So what the British people had to do was fill in those gaps. 
And that meant sometimes making new stories and sometimes they're in a rush. It was actually a case where they took the American superhero Kill Raven, who is a superhero that fights Martians and just literally redrew those comics to create the Ape Slayer to fill in gaps in Planet of the Apes comics. So now you have the Ape Slayer who fights gorillas from space. And honestly, isn't that the hero we need today? Marvel Italia was not as successful as Marvel UK. It took about 20 years before Euroforce so much as guest starred in an American comic. I will say that Marvel's Japanese comics have had a little bit more success lately, although they've been published by many different publishers. Uh, there's been a resurgence of Japanese comics lately, and that meant Marvel got to do a crossover between Attack on Titan and uh, the Avengers, which is pretty cool. It also means, rumor has it, that Spider-Man from Japan will get to cross over with Spider-Verse in the next movie. I really love to see that. In fact, that seems about as good a place as any to kind of wrap this up because well, I worked for Marvel for about 10 years. My first assignment for them was writing about Ken Masters that I mentioned from Marvel Comics number one. And my last assignment was writing about the Japanese Spider-Man. And with that, I'd like to kind of tie this all together by showing how I kind of link all these guys together. See, you had Wonder Comics, which became part of Pi Piper Comics, which became part of Inter In Eternity Comics. Which you get the idea. All of it merged together to become part of the house of ideas that is Marvel. And because Disney bought Marvel, now they're all part of the house of ideas. That is the House of Mouse. All right. Well, with that, my name is Kevin Garcia, and that's my presentation. Uh, I can take questions from anybody uh, about now. Amy? Kevin, that was awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, there were a lot of people who were making comments about having like, you know, I have that comic somewhere in a box. So that was kind of fun. Um, so the first question, that's a question that isn't probably a joke, <laughs> although we may get to those too. Uh, do you think a good way to reintroduce some of these characters might be through Disney plus then a whole generation could grow up on other Marvel comics that aren't just the Avengers? Well, I think that definitely applies to the international comics like Marvel UK and Marvel Italia because Disney Plus is trying to hit an international audience. So I'd love to see that. Like I said, when Captain Britain shows up in Marvel's What If series, I'd love Fury to show up. But the harder question is, what about those indie comics? And that comes down to asking the lawyers. See, technically Marvel owns those comics, but do they? Are there strings attached? There's got to be a reason Ultraverse hasn't been published. I actually know some people that worked there and they told me, oh man, I got a story to tell you, but they've never actually told me the story. So I don't know why. So not seeing a lot of questions in the thread here, um, but one of the questions that I had is that if you had unlimited funds, which one of these stories would you turn into a, a movie trilogy? Hmm. Well, to me, the, the big focus of I had unlimited funds would not so much to be take one of these stories and throw it into a movie trilogy, it'd be to throw all of them into it. DC in the 80s did a big thing where they just took all of these comic properties that they purchased and merged them all into one universe. So Shazam and, and Blue Beetle and these other characters suddenly became DC canon. I would love to see all of these random little obscure characters that Marvel technically bought brought into the Marvel Universe. Why not make Men in Black part of the S.H.I.E.L.D. organization? Or why not have uh, the Fury fight these uh, the totality of another universe from Air Cell or something? I'd love to see those things happen. Um, of course, I'm not the guy that can make that happen. Fair enough. So uh, we got a couple of questions in, which I, I knew would happen. Um, do characters die off if a company sells out and never revisits them or do the original creators ever get to go back to them? So that again, all comes down to legality. So in the case of Ultraverse, those characters have not come back. There've been pitches over the years where some of the original creators told Marvel, we'd love to do it. And those pitches just didn't happen. Now, whether that was just because editorial at the time thought it wasn't a good idea or because legal at the time thought it was a bad idea, I don't know. Um, but certainly they do eventually get to come back at some point. Like I said, uh, CrossGen came back and they made whole new comics and whole new ideas. Um, really, it's just a matter of time. I, I mentioned earlier the funny animal comics. Marvel recently published a new comic starring a character that hadn't been in a comic book since the 1940s. So, hey, you know, if Silly Seal can come back, anybody can come back. All right. So now we have a hypothetical. Um, who would win? Flaming Carrot versus Lord Pumpkin. 
Ooh, that's a tough one. Tough one. Lord Pumpkin is one of those guys like Batman, where if you give him enough time, he will outplan anybody. Whereas Flaming Carrot is one of those guys who's kind of like Howard the Duck in that, you know, he may not seem like he's trying, but he's still going to win at the end of the day. So um, I'd say, Ut, you know, Flaming Carrot is definitely going to win that one. Awesome. All right. Uh, how do you publics go into, excuse me, how do comics go into public domain? All right, that's, a, that's actually a really good question. I mentioned earlier in the chat when they were talking about the movie Night of the Living Dead, the reason it got shown so much, even labeled as a kid's movie sometimes, was because it had accidentally fallen into the public domain. And at the time, that meant that somebody had to actually put the little C with a circle on it on the first publication, and the first showing of Night of the Living Dead did not include it. So George Romero did not get to keep the rights to his own movie. And for comic books, it's, it's something very similar. See, a lot of older companies just didn't put the effort into renewing copyright every so many years and the even greater effort of renewing trademark, which required more money. Now, currently, currently copyright law works as if you make something, you own it flat out. That's just how it works. And it's going to stay with you well past after you die. So your family could actually inherit it. But copyright law as it existed back then said that if you didn't renew it with the Copyright Office on a regular basis, you didn't maintain it. So as a result, anybody who shows up in Centaur Publications is going to be public domain. That actually applies to a character here, Miss Fury. She was a character in newspaper strips in the 40s. Marvel published her comics in, when they were timely, uh, but that company went, the original company, not timely, went into public domain. So other characters, other companies could pick them up. Adventure picked them up and made their own comics. And then Malibu picked them up and made their own comics with Miss Fury. And now Marvel owns Adventure and Malibu. So technically Marvel has both the original copyright version, the original version made by Adventure and the version made by Malibu, also a version of Miss Fury that showed up recently in a Marvel comic. So other, character, other companies can use Miss Fury if they want because she as a character is public domain, but these versions of them belong to Marvel. And so it's kind of tricky in that way. So. Basically, it comes down to if that old company existed and they were able to maintain copyright when copyright laws changed, then those copyrights are still valid. If they didn't exist, then they may not stay. Now, it's different with trademark. With trademark, it comes down to who defended it. And like I said, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know the details behind the Dinosaurs for Hire thing, but Tom Mason applied for that trademark and he got it. So that means that he now owns Dinosaurs for Hire, as far as I know, again. Very cool outstanding all right so uh we've got a, a a few questions here and a lot of praise too so i hope that you go back and look at these later um dun, dun, dun. we had a guy dressed for space so i thought i'd dress for superheroes i love it that's so outstanding so what's the other question uh tell us about image comics revolt Okay, so we'll have to make that yeah. brief because I think we have to go to the other guys in a minute. But basically, Image Comics started when a bunch of creators who are really, really big at Marvel were getting more and more attention to the, to the point that uh, Rob Liefeld and Jim Lee and Todd McFarlane had the highest selling comic books of all time up to that point. Uh, and that was pretty amazing. So they decided to start their own universe. They actually went to Malibu originally, and Malibu was going to publish them until they were able to get enough capital to have their own line independent of Malibu. Uh, so uh, they actually were going to leave Marvel for a company that later became Marvel, but then they ended up starting their own on, uh, by themselves. Ultraverse kind of started as a reaction to that. You know, the image did this really amazing stuff. So Malibu wanted to have that kind of feel. So they got some of the best creators that didn't belong to image and said, make Ultraverse. You know? Excellent. Okay, so um, two people are asking this, so I'll go ahead and ask just to round this out. Why do you hate Aquaman? I hate Aquaman because he's a ripoff. He's not interesting, he's not good, and all the only reason he's popular is because in the 1960s, Superman, who was way more popular back then, had a TV show, and when they needed to expand it, they expanded it with the cartoons they had available, which were Aquaman, so it became the Superman Aquaman Hour. So now kids tuning in to see Superman now had to watch Aquaman as well. And then he got made part of the Super Friends and so on and so on and so on. Namor, on the other hand, who was a much better character in the 40s, kind of got forgotten. Uh, Marvel's tried to bring him back a few times, but he's just never had success that Aquaman did. And uh, well, and that just makes me just cringe at Aquaman. 
It's a uh, it's, it's a hard knock life. Bummer, but I know it's time. So uh, perhaps <laughs> another time we can be. Yeah. As my father always says, if that's the worst that happens to you, you'll have a good life. So, um, yes, you, know, you can take that one. All good right. advice, Kevin. Amy, thanks so much. Uh, let's keep this moving along, Kevin. You are. Thank you guys a, for having us. You are. Oh, you are a wealth. Um, yeah. maybe wealthy too. Have you be better? Okay, so everyone, it's uh, the nine thirty mark here on the East Coast. Six thirty for those of you on the West Coast. 6.30 for you, I'm sorry, 7.30 for you in the Rocky Mountains. And I think, what, 12.30 for those of you in Melbourne and Sydney and Brisbane and possibly Darwin. So good afternoon to the uh, Australian folks. All right, so the reason the every single one of you is here right now uh, is because uh, Nerd Zero is about to present. Uh, he's the, obviously the, uh, well, maybe say you don't know. Uh, Chris is the the founder, the godfather of Nerd Night. Uh, you should all bow down to him and um, steal onion rings from him because that's the nicest way to, to honor Chris. Um, I, so far in the last hour, two and a half hours since we began, have uh, had Doritos and pretzels and soup as snacks. <laughs> And I'm curious to see what other snacks all of you have been eating during the second ever Nerd Nightathon. Uh, the reason I asked that very important question about your snacking preferences is, of course, that's why we're here for Chris. Uh, he's going to explain a little bit about why your DNA make you predis may make you predisposed to or prefer some delicious foods over the others. So, um, yeah, Chris, tell us. All right, I'm going to tell you. I promise. Greetings from my appetizer sampler basket, everyone. Almost there. All right. Once again, greetings from my sampler basket. Today I'm going to speak a little bit about your DNA and the snacks that you eat. I should start with a disclaimer that basically every talk I've ever given has been on birds. Uh, and so I'm not gonna talk about birds today. I'm gonna talk about human DNA, pretty similar really, um, and stuff that's maybe uh, more directly relevant to your lives. Although birds, I know, I know a lot of you um, out there are huge fans uh, of the ornithology. But um, to get the ball rolling, I thought I would, you know, start with some background, um, a little bit about uh, what DNA is, uh, in, so that everybody's uh, uh, with me. And I think it's worth kind of like taking a step back, think about history. Um, it's been about 20 years now since, uh, as the New York Times put it that we cracked uh, the genetic code of human life. And that it, what that means is that the sequencing of the whole uh, uh, human genome. And so this was a huge, uh, highly momentous uh, uh, occurrence uh, that cost somewhere around $3 billion. Uh, and, and the hope at the time was really that with this information, we would be able to make strong predictions about uh, for example, the diseases we might all be susceptible to. Um, and I think at the time, we really thought we would be able to make almost perfect predictions, or at least some people um, thought that. Uh, you can see uh, in the picture here, there's one guy who's like super duper happy, like he is very excited. And that person is Francis Collins, who's, who led the sort of federal effort to sequence the human genome. Uh, he's now the director of the National Institutes of Health. And the other guy, he looks maybe less happy. That's Craig Venter. He was the, um, he led a, a sort of a competing effort and they, they, they sort of celebrated this thing as sort of like a tie. And, they, and, and two groups independently sequenced the human um, genome. And so while, while Francis Collins has gone on to become the director of the NIH, uh, I was able to find this picture of <laughs> Craig Venter online. And he seems to have become some guy from a Mad Max movie or, 
or maybe a Lex Luthor type character. Um, very interesting character, um, possibly trying to take over the world. Okay, the things I really want to say about DNA, though, um, uh, uh, to to get everybody on the same page is that uh, within your DNA, uh, there are these things called genes, and those genes can encode proteins that make up the stuff of your body, the enzymes that do things. Um, that's what makes you up. But it's kind of weird, like only 5% of the entire genome is made up of those genes. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about specific genes, and the rest is is what we call the junk. Um, not that kind of junk, but the but the junk DNA. And I like calling it the junk DNA. The second thing I wanted to talk about uh, with respect to DNA is how uh, how changes in the DNA, how how well that predicts um, anything about you. So this was one sl one picture I was able to find online from. 23andMe, the company you can send your mouth swab to to um, to, to to find out your uh, uh, to sequence your genome and to uh, to to see what uh, predispositions you might have. But the take-home message uh, from this really is that um, not all diseases are highly heritable. There are some uh, diseases towards the right of this where you, you might get your sequence back and you might have good confidence that you have a higher risk of certain types of um, diseases. And on the left side of this, you have other types of diseases where the environment plays a bigger role. And so for a lot, this is the only slide I could find on the internet. I was too lazy to make my own pretty picture. But the point I wanna make here is that a lot of stuff is in this kind of middle ground where there's this interplay between the DNA in your body and the environment that you expose yourself to, like the French fry basket that you eat or whatever. So the D genome wound up being not as predictive because the environment has this huge role in shaping um, your uh, physiology, your health. Okay, now that's the 101 on uh, genetics. Uh, and that relates closely to this other topic I wanna talk about, that's evolution. And so the simplest way to think about evolution is just change over time. And specifically, what I mean is really we're talking about changes in genes over time. Genes change because there are mutations that occur. So between you and any offspring you might have, there are going to be genetic differences. They're not only caused by the fact that you're mating with somebody else, but they're caused by this random process uh, called mutation. And so that's kind of one of the random parts of evolution. Those mutations occur. They might be good. They might be bad. You don't know in advance. And then the next part is you know, what happens to those mutations. Um, people always focus on the natural selection part. And this is really big in coronavirus. Everyone's talking about natural selection, culling the herd, survival of the fittest, blah, blah, blah. That's only part of the story. Um, that's the not random part of the story. So if you have a, a, a mutation that gives an advantage to you, what happens to you is not really random because that mutation could be conveying a benefit to your uh, physiology. But we do have this other part that people always forget about, which is the random part, genetic drift. There are also chance changes that occur. All right, that's evolution in a nutshell. So now, on to the snacks. Um, the snacks I'm going to talk about, I have to admit, they're kind of um, non-traditional snacks, if you will. Uh, you might not even call them snacks at all. Uh, the first one is milk. I'm going to talk about lactose intolerance. Second one is fish fat. That's definitely a snack. But I'm actually talking about omega-3 fatty acids. And then lastly, I'm talking about blood. Maybe not a snack. Uh, but I'm going to talk about blood groups, and I'm good. But I'm going to talk about how blood groups relate to um, your diet. Okay, lactose intolerance. Uh, I'm actually going to take a cue here from a speaker from our first virtual Nerd Nightathon, uh, Trevor, and incorporate drinking breaks into the, uh, the 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 show here. 
And so for lactose intolerance, I have my lactose themed drinking slide. Uh, this is from the Big Lebowski, which was previously mentioned by one of our speakers. It's not a particularly creative use of lact lactose in a cocktail, but there you have it. So what am I gonna say? Uh, most mammals, right? So what's the story with lactose intolerance? Most mammals stop drinking milk after weaning. It sort of makes sense. I kind of think it's weird that there are people who as adults sit down and drink a whole glass of milk. Ice cream's okay, but drinking a whole glass of milk is kind of gross. Um, but like most mammals, many of us stop producing lac the lactase enzyme um, during adolescence. And it sort of makes sense, right? Because you're no longer um, nursing. And so why should you be producing this enzyme that's involved in the breakdown of milk? But what turns out to have happened is that novel mutations, those random mutations that I talked about, um, have evolved and have enabled some humans to produce lactase as adults. And so the ability to produce this enzyme as adults is why some of us can drink milks, milk as adults. And so it's kind of cooler and more complicated than that um, in that it's actually multiple different mutations have arisen in different parts of the world that have enabled different groups of people um, to digest milk. And then those mutations have spread um, across much of the world. And so what's plotted here is the frequency of these mutations um, that allow you to digest milk in different parts of the world. And so the idea here is that independent mutations have arisen in West Africa, in Europe, uh, and, and now, um, and the Middle East. And, and now we have, by DNA sequencing, we now know what these mutations are and can, and can predict whether an individual um, would, will or will not be able to break down um, milk as an adult. It's pretty sweet. And so the idea there is that in these, um, in these populations where this, this trait has evolved, these are populations that have had a long history of um, cattle domestication and using milk as, uh, as a source uh, of additional nutrition. And so in association with that uh, uh, agriculture, these mutations have arisen and increased in frequency because they provided a benefit to those populations where there were cows being used for milk. Okay, omega-3 fatty acids. This is the second um, drinking slide. So this one, I didn't have a good idea um, in advance as to what I was gonna use. So I had to, I had to Google a cocktail with, sorry, I Googled, I looked for a cocktail with sardines in it. I thought something like that must exist. And uh, if you do that, you'll turn up this video, which I suggest you watch for a more creative, co uh, a, a more creative uh, cocktail. And I, I, I encourage you all to enjoy this on your spare time. I haven't, I haven't tried it yet. It's very complicated. I only have whiskey because I'm in quarantine. I don't have any of the ingredients to make this cocktail, but, but yes, there you have it. So omega-3 fatty acids. So 10% of Americans take fish oil supplements. Uh, I think this is kind of gross, but I, I, I've tried it as well. Kind of, you know, a little bit cholesterol high for me too. Um, but recent trials have failed to show a reduction in stroke uh, or heart disease risk um, following using these sorts of supplements. But there's good news actually. Um, when I originally uh, gave this talk, things were looking kind of bleak. Actually, I think that the, the current state of affairs is a lot better and there is some, some evidence that this um, does help. But again, I study birds for a living, consult your physician. Um, but an interesting point about this is that the studies that uh, led to this idea that taking fish oil supplements might help were actually conducted on a very specific uh, group of humans, that is the Inuit. And so a few years ago, there was this article in the New York Times about this, and you can um, uh, uh, find this as well with the Google. And this is based on some really cool evolutionary genetics research. Um, that showed that actually Inuit populations have evolved uh, to metabolize omega-3 fatty acids because of the high, the large amounts of those in their diet. 
And so a researcher in the 70s found that these populations had lower disease of lower rates of heart disease uh, and thought maybe if the whole world tried this, it would work. And well, that might have not been exactly the best idea because genotypes, genomes differ around the world. But now, happily, it's looking like some of this benefit might actually be more um, uh, widespread. OK, the next one, ABO blood groups. So this is one uh, I'll say, I didn't know that this was a thing, um, that people base their diet on ABO blood groups. I also wasn't sure what I would find when I tried to look up cocktails um, relating to this uh, topic. So old reliable Huffington Post, I found this little piece about 10 brilliant uses for blood sausage. Uh, and I've quoted here that um, a, big, a big blood sausage fan, he suggested pairing it with a cocktail called the blood and sand, which comprises scotch, uh, Rosso vermouth, cherry hearing, and orange juice. I don't even know what all those things are. I definitely don't have any of them during quarantine. But if you're looking for a pairing for blood sausage for this, and you have all of those ingredients for this part of the talk, whip one of those up and have a drink. You can't see my drink because it's pixelated in front of my um, mozzarella sticks, but I'm drinking, trust me. Okay, so the reason I, I heard about this thing called the blood group, ABO blood group uh, diet, uh, if any of you are on this diet, please uh, divulge in the, in, the, in the chat. I'm really curious about how many people are, are, are on this diet. I was sitting on Amtrak pre-COVID I think I was going from North Carolina to uh, Washington, DC. And there was just this very interesting and animated conversation happening right next to me about the benefits of the blood group diet. And I had to, I had to look this up and figure out what it was and add it to my Nerd Night talk. Um, OK, so what it is, well, first of all, it's a thing. And the basic idea here is that the O blood type, hypothetically speaking, is ancestral for humans. And so because ancestral humans were um, uh, carnivorous or more carnivorous, um, if you have the O blood type, you are supposed to have a heavily meat-based diet. Um, the A blood type, you're supposed to be vegetarian because that evolved in the context of an agrarian lifestyle. And the, if you're a B blood type, you're supposed to be, uh, you're the nomadic genealogy and you're supposed to have a more dairy focused uh, blood type. But there's, there's no evidence that choosing diet based on your blood type um, really helps. So this one, there's, there's maybe less positive news. I mean, I guess, so I will say there is some positive news. Um, if you follow any diet, it is better than whatever your French fry basket diet that you're currently on is. So if you re get this book and you follow these diets, any of them, irrespective of blood type, I think there's some evidence that you're, you'll be more healthy because of the lack of French fries. But but the correlation between what you eat and your blood type, that that's as far as is not a thing. And I want and and so there's a scientific, so this is sort of maybe the I don't know, the esoteric way to think about why it's not a thing. Um, and what this is is a phylogeny showing the relationships of primates. Um, and it's showing where we have different blood, these different blood types on the phylo phylogeny of primates. So some, some um, abbreviations here, NWM is new world monkeys, OWM is old world monkeys, hominoids are humans highlighted in the red box uh, and their relatives. And so the general point of this is that the A and the B and the O blood types are dispersed all across the 
phylogeny of primates. And what that tells you is that, well, it's not just that O, it's not as simple as O being ancestral to humans, right? There's clearly O blood types outside of humans as well as A and B. So the ev there's not really evidence that O is an ancestral meaty blood type associated with humans or B or A. There's a lot of interesting stuff written about the evolution of blood types, um, including this paper, but um, you shouldn't base your diet on it. I mean, it won't hurt probably, but it probably won't help and there's not a good uh, reason to do so. Okay, so now, so those those studies that I highlighted were kind of the bulk, the focus of the talk, and I and I wanted to uh, sort of provide a really fast whirlwind tour of like all of the things that are going on now. There's a whole class of approaches called genome genome wide association studies, where you know you sequence a bunch of genome from a bunch of people and see what new what mutations are associated with what traits, and a lot of times this is done in a very descriptive a correlation based way. So the studies I mentioned before, those involve specific enzymes that we know a lot about, specific proteins that we know a lot about. Um, a lot sometimes GWAS studies are just, you know, they're just like looking for stuff. And so they're 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 really difficult to interpret sometimes. Um, and it takes a lot of work to to actually demonstrate a correlation between any particular mutation and a trait. But there are some really fun ones, and I wanted to highlight them really quickly. Um, so there's this one about ha 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 sniffing out significant p values. Um, this has to do with why your asparagus, uh, when you eat asparagus, your p smells funny. Um, this one, uh, again, GWAS is genome wide association study. And so this is like from science Twitter. Uh, we have reached peak GWAS. This is uh, the identification of mutations associated with Marmite. Some people call it Vegemite preference. Uh, this is an interesting one. Some of you may have heard that uh, cilantro preference is um, genetically based, and there is some evidence for that, and it has to do with olfactory receptors, which have to do with your sense of smell. And so this one kind of makes sense. All of these are out there in the world. Whether or not these are really vetted yet, I think is probably questionable, but these, but you can vet them and people are working on understanding these mutations and, and what they do. Um, and so with that, I will say thanks and I will take any questions. Oh man, I don't even know where to, know where to begin. Uh, so first, well, Alice, so, so in, the, in the lovely map you showed early in the beginning, uh, Sri Lanka, and a lot of uh, like the southern half of India was dark purple, was dark blue. Does that mean that you are anti-American and hate milkshakes? So I think so. It, it would be interesting to sequence my genome and see what's going on there. I can, I can drink uh, milk and milkshakes, and I do enjoy doing so. If I drink too much milkshake, as what happens when I usually start a milkshake, I think that that can go south. You know, without without putting you know without going into too much detail, but how, 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 I, <laughs> how, how go? no, no, I, 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 I'm fully capable of uh, digesting uh, uh, my, my lactose. Um, I think milkshakes are just a little intense. I don't know. Sounds like, uh, sounds like you're trying to brag or show off a little bit to me. That's what that's oh, about. Yeah, always. Um, also, I will ask, so uh, for, for the audience, this is a very important fact to know uh, that uh, in addition to the fact that we obviously established in the chat area, unbeknownst to Chris, that he is obviously going to be getting the chum guzzler for some <laughs> day drinks because that seems like the right thing to do, is that uh, he. I also... didn't want to say that word out loud, but. <laughs> um, and it's guzzling. There are two perfectly acceptable, acceptable words. Uh, the Chris's favorite preferred shot is tequila and milk, uh, presumably also because it, uh, he wants to show off his lack toast tolerance so um if you see chris at some point in your life please do buy him tequila and milk shots because he'll think they're delicious um fun uh, fun wazowski fun fact uh, while we're waiting here is that uh my dad in high school civics in the early 1960s uh, he he i think he won a prize or else he just got some praise from his teacher because he still 
uh, talks about this to this day, is that he came up with the idea that on our, everyone's driver's license, because people get in car accidents all the time, I guess, uh, that you should have your blood type printed on your license. So when you need that blood transfusion, when, you're, uh, when your car crashes, that it's uh, easy to figure out. Um, so Chris, do you know what your blood type is? Nope. I do not know what my blood type is. <laughs> we are really bad nerds. We should do We should do that little test. We could do that. We can do that as a quarantine uh, party. We could do that. We got a one in four chance of getting it right. So <laughs> uh, that that's something. Uh, what, what else? Oh God. Uh, uh, so oh, Chris. So Scott wants to know. Um, so Scott used to live near the Midway, which is very uh, very important. Uh, did you ever chug beer at Foley's Fireside Tavern in Forest Hills? Yes. Yes. I used to know one of the bartenders there. Uh, uh, it was it was it was not my go-to place, uh, but because the midway was. But I have been to the fire. There's also another really nice bar with a cool name in that neighborhood called the Old Stag. The Old Stag is not not there anymore. And there's also the water. The what is it? The water fountain. There's all these these great old man bars, dive bars, whatever you want to call them. Awesome bars. They, I think they might be gone because JP is too fancy now. But I think the midway still um, persists. Chris, we've got a challenging question for you. Have there been any good studies on particular genes determining how people process sugar and whether they are more likely to get pleasure from it? I'm gonna, so the, the, this is one of those questions where I'm just gonna say, I don't know, but I'm gonna assume the answer is yes. <laughs> Oh, I'll t I can tell I can tell a good anecdote. There's a good because I can talk about birds. <laughs> so um, hummingbirds uh, eat nectar, uh, but most birds are, do not do not, and therefore do not have the taste receptors that are involved in um, perceiving sweet tastes. But in hummingbirds, there's a there's a unique mutation that has enabled them to taste sweet using the taste receptor, which is a gene um, that is normally used to perceive more savory tastes, umami, uh, if you will. So I can answer about birds, but I don't know, I don't know anything about people. Yeah, people are the worst, they're, they're overrated. Um, oh, also we had, a, we had a question much earlier on in the beginning of the presentation. Uh, I didn't want to forget about this one. Uh, should pet birds be fed uh, solely based on their blood types? Man, parakeet. Should I only feed it blood sausage? I think I think blood sausage is a perfect. I, I yes. My my wife is a veterinarian, and and she highly recommends feeding blood sausage to your parakeets. No. She no. She's making a note. She's saying no, no, don't do that. Uh, it seems like a good recommendation. Uh, gluten intolerance, fact or fad? Ooh. See, this is the problem about me talking about humans. Yep. I'm gonna say it's uh, it's a bit of both, right? I think I think there is, there are definitely people who are gluten intolerant, um, but I'm gonna guess that the frequency is less than the frequency of people who think they might be gluten intolerant. Don't quote him on that. He doesn't know anything about people. People are the worst. All right, Chris, <laughs> stop sharing your screen. What? Stop sharing your screen. You're you're hogging oh. your for uh. <laughs> For, uh, for Curtis, who's about to hop on. Okay, I can do that. That's very kind of you. Um, all right, so uh, also important fact, everyone, which I, I did mention this earlier, why, uh, uh, so Amy, who you just met an hour ago from one of the co-bosses of Nerd Night Austin, uh, has in fact been uh, sort of doing a lot of front lines, middle lines work in, in, in our current situation. And uh, she does recommend that if you go to a blood bank, they will tell you your blood type uh, as the, of course, the blood banker that she is. So Chris, go to go donate some blood and plasma and you'll get that mystery salt. Great. Uh, okay, so we are coming into the last hour here. Uh, we've got our friends from North Vancouver who are here ready to delight us. Uh, Curtis is a uh, you know, he's a fancy internet celebrity when it comes to explaining science to all of us in many terms. 
And uh, Crystal, you're hiding. Crystal, turn on your microphone and your webcam. You should be giving the explanation, or the enough explanation. You should be giving Curtis's introduction. You know him better than I do. Although Curtis, we could become really quick friends right now um, if that would make you feel better. I mean, right now, I don't know if you can hear on my mic, but we're doing the, the Vancouver cheer for the health workers is happening right now. So I feel like I'm actually, there's like a, there's like an actual applause, which is kind of odd. Good. That's nice. It's good that you can hear some face-to-face, -face, uh, some face-to-face -face love because, you know, it's harder to replicate in this type of a situation. It's my um, favorite time of the day, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, yeah, hey, take, take, it, take it where you can get it. Yeah. Uh, all right, so Crystal, Crystal's hiding, so Hey everyone, Crystal is the co-boss. I can introduce myself. <laughs> here at North Vancouver. She was gonna introduce Curtis, but she's not going to now because I'm gonna do it because Crystal, you're still hiding. I'm sorry to embarrass you publicly. Uh, we wanna learn a little bit about how to teach science education virtually, and we're going to do that virtually. So I'm gonna shut up. Um, Curtis, it's all you, go dazzle. Cool, okay. So I'm gonna to talk today about when my, there we go, it's loaded. Um, I'm going to talk about making videos, specifically videos that teach people things. Um, I've spent the last couple of years making science videos on YouTube full time. And I'm going to talk today a little bit about what that was like and what that's been like for me. But mostly I'm going to try to give kind of like a crash course in making videos for you. I'm hoping that people watching might actually start to make their own videos. That's the goal. Okay. So um, I started making YouTube videos back in 2007, a long time back. And my videos started out really simply. They were just me usually holding a camera and talking about a topic. Now, I would pick a topic like our education system. And I had some thoughts on that and I would do some research on that. And I would think, okay, here's some ways we need to improve our education system. But if I just lecture, then that's gonna be boring. So I'll tell a story. So I told this, I made this video titled why I used to get kicked out of science classes, um, which is a true story about why I used to have to run laps at the start of every physics class because my teacher would kick me out because I had too much energy. Now the video is just me walking around a track and um, telling this story about why that happened. It's really simple. I'm just holding the camera. And that's the sort of video that I started with on YouTube. And eventually I started making more and more complicated videos until when I was doing it full time, um, I was making videos like this one, how I proved the earth is round in brackets with my bike and two sticks. So this video takes a very simple concept about using two sticks to, to make shadows from the sun and uh, using some math and knowing the distance between them, which I measured with my bike, I could figure out how big the earth was and prove that it's round because there's a lot of people that think the earth is, is flat right now, if you've been following along on the internet. Um, so I made this video and it, it did really well. And this is still a simple concept, but done at a big scale. So that's the sort of thing that I do. I wanted to make a video about how we teach climate change to people, but that's a big and complicated topic. So I decided to kind of make it more simple and specific by talking about plants in a jar because you know, plants, they, they use uh, carbon dioxide from the air and they build their plant matter out of that and little animals and microbes in the soil, they, they use the oxygen the plants make out, put, put out. So I figured this is like a simple system that would explain how living organisms interact with the air that they breathe. And again, since I do big YouTube videos, I made it bigger. I put myself in a jar uh, for 15 hours. And I showed people how we interact with the air that we breathe and how in doing so in interacting with it in the ways we have, we're creating, we're causing climate change. So um, that's the sort of work that I do. It's been pretty odd in the last uh, few years, especially, but it, it's been delightful. Now, now um, we're in a, an odd time and it's a good time to start a YouTube channel. Um, and I've always actually said that now, whenever that, whenever it is, now is a good time to start because you can put it off to later and um, well, you know, it'll just maybe later never happens. But there's also a lot of people right now that have some time on their hands and they've always wanted to start a YouTube channel. So if you're one of those people, um, now's the time and I hope you do. 
I'm going to walk you through it. First things first, you got to pick a topic for your very first video. Don't worry about what the title of your channel is going to be or any of that. Just start focus on what video you want to make. And when you have a topic, make sure that it's simple and specific. For the rest of this talk, I'm going to use one example of one video that I've worked on. So I wanted to make a video about the Earth. That's too broad. I'm going to be more specific. I wanted to make a video about how the Earth rotates, how it turns. Still a little too broad, so I decided to make it specifically on one experiment that shows that the Earth turns, and it's called the Foucault pendulum. It's just a really big pendulum, and over the course of uh, more well over the course of a day at the North Pole, the Earth rotates beneath this swinging pendulum, and you can actually watch the Earth turn beneath the pendulum. It's a cool experiment. It's really, um, really elegant. I wanted to explain how that experiment worked. So I'm making this video. Start with what you know. I knew a lot about this experiment before I started. Um, it's my favorite science experiment. So I was starting with a topic that I knew a lot about, which is what I recommend. Then work with what you've got. You probably don't have a Foucault pendulum at home. So maybe that's a bad topic to do. But there's also, I, I saw a YouTube video a while back about a guy, uh, by a guy that really liked the Foucault science experiment. He didn't have one, but he got a bowling ball and a big rope and found an elevator shaft and made his own. So you've got to get creative sometimes. Um, you don't always have everything at hand, but just get creative. Use what you can. Find, figure out what you could get if you don't have it and, um, yeah, and, and work from there. Maybe maybe you've realized at this point that the thing you're trying to do, you don't have any of those components, then maybe you should just pick a different topic. Uh, that's okay. I've thrown a lot of topics out the windows after starting some work on them. So once you actually have your topic, you can title your video. I know we haven't even filmed it yet, but make a title for your video now because it'll help in two ways. One, it'll help you really know what your video is going to be about. And when you're doing the rest of the, the planning, the writing, the shooting, the editing, you can make sure that everything in the video relates back to that title. So it can really help drive what you're doing. And number two, it's really important to have a good title when you're making videos. Um, if a video's title is 200 words long, no one's gonna see it. And if it's vague, if it's too short, people aren't gonna watch it. So this title is actually pretty short for me, but it is exactly what the video is. The title I decided was Watch the World Turn because I decided that I would not only make a video about the Foucault pendulum, but I would do a kind of time-lapse of a pendulum so that you would only see it when it was at its apex, when it was um, at the furthest part of its swing. And that way uh, you would be able to watch the world rotate under a very still pendulum. That was the goal. So next step, you have your topic, do your research. Uh, maybe you feel like you already know a lot about it, but if you read more, you might find little tidbits that are fascinating that you didn't know about, or you might figure some ways that you, you had some wrong ideas about the topic. I definitely learned some things when reading and watching videos about Foucault pendulums in doing this. This part cannot be understated, especially if you're doing actually educational videos. It's really important to do your research. Next thing is find the story. I make science videos. And the number one thing that I think about in making them is the story, which is not usually how people think about science, but people, people thrive on stories. Our brains have evolved to, to tell and hear and share stories. So figure out what the story of your topic, whatever it is, figure out the story for it and show people the story. Don't just tell them the story. An example here is some guy throws a basketball into a net. And that's it. That's the whole story. There's a setup. He's going to try to throw a basketball into the net. Oh, and he's on a skyscraper. The challenge, he throws the ball. You're wondering while you're watching this, how many times has he thrown it? Is this his first attempt? Is, you know, is he going to get it in this try or are we going to watch another four minutes of this video? The climax, it goes in the net on the first try and he, or not on the first try, on the first try we see, and he's so excited. That's the resolution. Um, he's liter he literally jumps up and down for joy. It's a 30 second story and it has 106 million views on YouTube. 
it's a very simple story. And I think that we can kind of all model whatever our um, topics are off of this setup, challenge, climax, resolution, that sort of model. Next is to plan your video. And this is the most important step. Above all else, you want to be as prepared as possible. So for this video, my plan was to make a time lapse of a pendulum and um, and oh, and, and it was going to take 36 hours for the, the Earth to rotate beneath this pendulum. It's complicated as to why it's not 24. You can watch the video to find that out. But um, it was going to take 36 hours. And I wanted to not only make the time lapse, but I wanted to film myself in the video explaining it as an animation. So I wrote the script and I figured out what I would be doing and saying at every point for the next 36 hours. So I made that whole plan. And then I actually had to make, sorry, there's some noise in my neighborhood. I actually had to make um, specific electronics that would use, that would, that would trigger my cameras so that I could get the actual footage that I was trying to shoot. So I built some electronics for this video. I had to contact the university that had uh, the pendulum that I wanted to shoot. So I had to make all these plans. I had to get there, I had to bring all my equipment. The goal is that by the time you get to actually filming your video, that should be the easiest part. Um, so here's what it look, might look like for you. Obviously, you're probably not going to be spending 36 hours in a stairwell under a pendulum, I hope, because that was quite a, I'll never do that again. That was one of those experiences. Um, but for you, you still want to make a plan. So plan where you're going to be filming. If you're in your apartment, like I am, then you're going to want to maybe find a window and film so that the light, my window's over here. I'm going to want to film so, so that the camera's looking this way. I can show you what that might look like. If I'm filming this way, you get the light coming onto me. That's great. But if I'm filming this way, you see, you know, my face is kind of darkened and the light from the window is really bright. So choose where you're filming, figure out where the light is and make that work for you. Um, okay. Next thing, where's the light? Next thing, what I just did, moving the camera side to side, that can be nauseating and it can add for leg, it can blur the video. Don't do that, never do that. Always keep the camera steady. Even if you don't have a tripod, that's okay. You can put the, your camera or your iPad in the photo here, you can put it on a stack of books and that will do the job. Just make sure your camera is steady and, and shoot Shoot horizontal, don't shoot vertical. Never do this unless you're shooting for Instagram or Twitch. When talking about video, something a lot of people don't think much about is sound, but it's very important to have good sound. So um, you'll hear a lot of people talking really loudly or talking very animatedly. A lot of that time, a lot of the time that's just to make sure that the mic is picking them up. If you, if you speak loudly, and you speak close to the mic, then it's going to sound a lot better. So just try to do that. If you have a, a microphone and you can sync the audio, that's better. But for now, just make sure you speak loudly. OK. Oh, and keep it simple. You don't need a fancy backdrop. Um, I built one at one point that was really cool and had all sorts of science things on it. But now, honestly, I'm, I'm fine with just shooting with a white background. It doesn't matter as long as your story is good and your content's good and your sound's good. Film the video. Now this should be the shortest step if you've done everything right. Um, I say that even though the video that I'm using as an example is like it took me 36 hours of continuous filming and this is a photo of me in the bathroom at four in the morning, it, like in a, in, a, in a university bathroom wondering what I've done with my life. But anyway, this should be the shortest, simplest step if you've prepared everything. My only advice for this is just to relax, have fun, be yourself. You can do as many takes as you need to usually. Um, so don't, don't worry about getting things wrong. You can just do it again. And usually I film the whole video. I film everything I want to say. And then once I know I have all my footage, I actually go back to the beginning and I do it all over again. And I find that usually that take, I'm much more relaxed and I do a better job. And I usually end up using that footage. Okay, so you've filmed your video. Almost at the end here, you edit the video together. 
this is really, really important no matter how long your video is and no matter what you put in it. You always want to make it as short as you possibly can. Videos on YouTube do well at like five minutes. Um, and on a lot of other streaming platforms, it's even shorter. So there shouldn't be any dead air. There shouldn't be a point where you're just sitting and looking at the camera or you're reading your line. You should try to cut out all of that dead air as, as much as that is possible and repetition, cut out repetition. Um, if something doesn't add to your message, if it doesn't add to the story, just cut it out. There's a lot of free software that you can use. Um, I've used iMovie a lot and it's great. Again, because all you're going to usually be doing is just cutting things. Um, so iMovie is free on, on iMacs and Apple, um, like on iPhones. There's free software for Windows and Linux called OpenShot. That's also really good. It's also very simple. I use software called DaVinci Resolve, and it's a lot more advanced. And it's kind of complicated if you're just getting started, but it's excellent and it's also free. Either way, find some way to make your video as short as possible. The second last step is publish it and upload it. So this is some footage, a GIF from, whoop, I got maybe kicked off the call just then. Oh no, I got ad block. I don't know how that popped up. Um, anyway, go back to it. One slide back. Right, so, sorry about that. So. This is a, a clip from that final pendulum video that I made, and you can see the pendulum is, uh, is, seems to be, or the earth seems to be moving beneath the pendulum. That was watching the world turn. So upload your video. Wait, sorry, hey, yeah, Curtis, let me uh, interrupt for one second there. It sounded like yeah. you said sharing that last clip, but we didn't see it, so maybe hit screen share again and uh, try that back up again. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, let me find where it is. Zoom is my screen share. Here we go. Share. Cool, are we back? Yeah, that's better, there we go. Okay, cool. Um, let me go back one slide, maybe. Okay, okay, now you can see it? Yep, okay. I'll I'm just, okay, cool. So this is just a GIF. From that video, you can see the earth moving beneath the pendulum. It took me two months of work to get to this point, um, but you can kind of get a sense of what this video is all about. It's watch the world turn. This is just a gift from a long video, but the point here is finally you get to publish and upload your video. It's really easy, especially as you're starting out, to get really discouraged when you finally pr press publish on your video, whether it's on YouTube or on Twitter or Facebook. Instagram, wherever you publish it, it can be discouraging when you see that it only gets 10 views or five views or 100 views, whatever it is. And my advice to you is, is don't let that get to you. As long as you're enjoying making the videos, just keep making the videos. It can take a long time and a lot of stuff. You can make a lot of videos before you get really happy with them and before you build an audience. But the main thing is you have to be enjoying it or it's, it's really not worth it. Um, because I know a lot of people say that they're gonna start a YouTube channel so that they can make a million dollars on YouTube. And that just doesn't happen with an exception of an extremely tiny, tiny minority of YouTubers. The goal needs to be have fun and educate people in my case. Um, but if you make a lot of stuff, you'll get better over time. I've made a hundred YouTube videos or more um, at this point, and it's been a lot of fun. And yeah, I guess that, that's, that's my talk. So <laughs> I hope you make some stuff. And thanks for listening. I'm looking forward to some questions. Hi. Am I actually oh, here? Hi, Crystal. Hey, hey, Curtis. Hey, everybody in North Bend and the world. Sorry, my Zoom totally froze. I still don't know what's going on, but um, oh, good. I'm just trying to look in the chat here and get some questions. I actually have a question. I was looking um, at your YouTube channel as I always do. And I saw that recently you had to turn off a lot of the comments because you were getting so much negative feedback. Can you sort of expand on that a bit? Yeah, so I make a lot of videos about topics that seem to be controversial, like the shape of the earth. A lot of, a lot of people on, Facebook, on YouTube think that the earth is flat. Well, I'm recently have been making more videos about climate change, which also is still controversial to a lot of people. So I get a lot of 
comments that are negative, like a lot of hate comments. I also get a lot of comments from people that are just spreading false information. Um, that's unfortunately a big part of the internet and it's kind of complicated to know how to deal with that sometimes. On the one hand, you don't just want to um, stop everybody from saying anything because conversation is how we sort of educate people. But on the other hand, you can't just have a continuous stream of misinformation. That's, that's bad as well. So it's hard to know what to do. I try to moderate as much as possible without putting too much of my time into it. But um, yeah, it's a tricky part of the business. So I also get a lot of wonderful, positive comments from people. And I'm, I'm so fortunate and feel so lucky to have those people. I have a great community overall. True, true. And um, does that, did that have any effect on your decision to start doing documentary films as opposed to YouTubing or? Um, I think that- Cheers, by the way. Biggest, yeah, <laughs> the, biggest, the biggest part of my decision in switching to make a doc, I'm making a documentary about climate change now. The biggest reason I switched to doing that is because I was really frustrated with the format of YouTube, um, partly because topics like climate change don't perform very well on the platform. Um, YouTube doesn't really seem to recommend those videos to people. And also because I was tired of making a, you know, a five minute video, which is short. And then only, you know, only one of the one minute of that video is actually me saying, here's what you can do about climate change. And the rest of it would be, you know, me just trying to get the attention to drive people to that last minute. And I found that frustrating. So I want to make longer form. And uh, that, that's, that's the, the main reason I'm switching. So I don't have too many questions, just lots of praise here on the chat, which is great. Um, I want to tell everyone about my favorite video that exists on YouTube, which just so happens to be by you. It is All the... Right. Yes, it's the history of the universe in 13,799 dominoes. And it's the first conversation that you and I ever had when I saw you speak at Nerd Night Vancouver. And I'm still obsessed with that video. I share it all the time. I'm going to put a link up to it later. So can you just tell us a bit? And do you still have the almost 14,000 dominoes that you made yourself? Yeah, I do. I want um, one. I have, a big, I, have a, I have a bag of, of dominoes that I can't wrap my arms around back at my parents' farm. Um, so that video took me months to make, but I actually made thousands and thousands of dominoes by hand for, out of wood. And the, the point of the video was that each of those single dominoes, each one would represent a million years from the Big Bang to modern day. And I set them up in a continuous row, a line of dominoes that was 300 meters long. And I, I knocked them down. And as they were falling, I narrated the history of everything. And um, I, tried, I tried to do it my, as best I could. And uh, it was really tense for me. And it was like, I'm really, really happy with how, how the video turned out. And uh, yeah, it's old. The people don't understand how vastly old the universe is. It's 13.8 billion years old. And that's a big number. I thought you meant the video because it was two years old, <laughs> but no. Um, so I want to tell, we've got a little bit of noise around here. I want to tell everyone about something really cool that you and I were a part of this year. Before the lockdown, we were able to have one last nerd night here in North Van. And you'll notice I have a t-shirt on and it's a teen nerd night. Curtis was our key speaker at the first ever teen nerd night where he spoke to almost a hundred students between 13 and 17 and he just slayed. They loved it. So that was really cool. Thanks so much for doing that. And uh, thanks for doing this talk. Unfortunately, we couldn't see you in person, but we're hoping to do something crazy together in the near future. Um, we have one last question, maybe, if you want to finish on that. What are some of the challenges you face when explaining complex topics for people who have no prior knowledge on them in short video formats? It's hard. I think a lot of people, especially scientists, think that they can just start jumping in right into the research that they do in the lab. It's really important to break things down as simple as possible because a lot of people, you know, they maybe maybe they have a high school diploma, maybe they don't, right? So my goal is to make sure that a five-year-old would be able to understand the video. And there's a lot of really smart five-year-olds, but the point I'm making is that they don't necessarily have a very large vocabulary. So if if a five-year-old might not have that word in their vocabulary, I either have to explain it or avoid it. And I've done pretty well, I think. Like I don't get a lot of questions asking for clarification on things because 
Like I just explain it like they're five and that seems to work really well. Um, yeah, and thanks so much for having me. And that was, this is fun. And uh, Matt in New York has one question. Why make the dominoes instead of buy them? Where Matt, if you find a place where you can buy that many dominoes and not spend a small fortune or buy a ton of plastic, then let me know. Um, in the meantime, if you want to borrow some dominoes, you know, I've got them at home. <laughs> it's just hard to find them. That's all. Awesome. Is that good, Matt? Yeah, that's great. And actually, I, I Curtis, I'll ask you, I, Curtis, uh, I'll ask you a question. Um, also, hit the uh, the stop, hit the share screen button again, so we can uh, have that control back. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah. So I, I've I've seen your video with thirteen and a half thousand dominoes. It's a lot of dominoes to uh, to hand make. Then uh, they seem like they're very high quality dominoes. How did did you have to sand them extensively? What was the process? There we go. Wait, it, seemed, uh, it seemed like it would be a lot of work besides just cutting wood into small tiny pieces. Yeah, um, they, the, the process was that I had a little, I had a pallet of wood that were, they were one by two planks and I cut them with a bandsaw, each one individually. They actually weren't <laughs> that high quality of domino because one side of them ended up being really rough. And so as they fell, two things were happened. As they fell, there was enough friction that they were slow to fall which meant that I planned to make a six minute video and it ended up being a nine minute video. So I had to totally yeah. change my script at the last minute. And also they were completely silent. They were, they were, they were like foam pads. So they, they were quiet and people love the sound of dominoes. So I had to, after I filmed it, is a it satisfying sound. yeah, I had to go in and fake the sound of dominoes, which took days and no one noticed, which is great, I guess. Uh, that sounds that sounds like a win. Well, it was uh, it was great. So thanks so much for uh, joining us, and I'm glad you had a round of applause uh, 27 minutes ago. Everyone's clapping. I, it wasn't. I, yeah, <laughs> it was just weird. That I applaud everyone. That's everyone that's actually out there doing doing the, the hard work they need to do. But anyways, thanks so much for having me. No problem. Thanks so much. Thanks, Crystal. Thanks for doing this, Matt. Really appreciate it. We have it. made it almost. We've made it. 87.5% of the way through. And now for uh, one of the great advantages of the internet is that we can move beyond North America now to a whole new continent, um, nearly um, almost literally as far away from possible uh, from me on earth right now uh, come our, uh, comes our final presentation. Uh, so we've got Aaron standing by in Melbourne Australia, where it's now, uh, and, uh, and Wade is one of the co-bosses. I'll introduce him in one second. So actually, so wait, is it is it one thirty in the? No, it's twelve twenty-seven. One twenty-seven, right? Twelve, uh, twelve twenty-seven in the afternoon. Twelve twenty-seven. So I, I yeah, jumped ahead yeah. an hour and three minutes. Uh, wait, how it? dare you? <laughs> why don't you, uh, Wade? Why don't you explain to everyone uh, here in North America why you uh, why you don't sound like a funny Australian? Oh, I've worked with addiction coach for many years, many, many years to get rid of my Australian accent. Um, I grew up in a northern uh, a community in northern Canada called Fort St. John, and then I moved to Edmonton and I started uh, with, uh, with Adam uh, uh, up in Edmonton, started Nerd Night Edmonton. Uh, then I started my PhD, moved to Australia, and I started Nerd Night Wagga. Uh, that didn't continue until when I left, but when I got to Melbourne, I joined the Nerd Night Melbourne team and I've been uh, working with the wonderful team here. We've been growing the, the project and it's been getting bigger and bigger and it's uh, delightful to be included in this global uh, event. And thankfully it's not in the middle of our night for this to be happening. So thanks for including right. us. Well, of course, and you, you hold the, I guess, I never thought about this really until just now, but I guess you, I suppose that you hold the distinction of having been the co-boss of the most nerd nights in the globe. Now that, now this Wow. Is, yeah. Oh, now it makes me want to move. <laughs> right. Now you just got, you to really keep... make sure I can keep that record. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's important. That'll really, uh, it'll really take you places. All right, so let me, uh, let me get out of the way here. You can uh, introduce Aaron. You can talk a little bit about Nerd Night Melbourne, and um, I'll see you, see you on the other side. So let me uh, turn off my stuff and take it away. Sounds great. Thanks very much for having us, uh, Matt, for organizing this. I think it's delightful to see the global nerd community coming together. Uh, I've been watching uh, throughout, in addition to my various um, uh, meetings that I've had to go to today, because um, it is our work day here. 
Um, and uh, it's been a bit, bit of a rough start to the year in Australia. We had uh, some the, the worst wildfires that the country's ever seen, and now we've got this to deal with. But there has been some good news. Um, the social distancing seems to be doing the thing it's intended to do. We only had 29 new cases overnight. And so that is, uh, that's good news. And, um, uh, you know, th of the bad news that we've had to face this year uh, is the end of the good place. But we also had the delightful Aaron to share with us uh, some of the psychology or the uh, philosophy behind the good place. And he did his talk, um, was it the beginning of this year, Aaron? It was January, wasn't it? Or your audio is not on just yet. So you can turn it in mic whenever you want, because I'll turn off mine when it's ready to go. But yeah, uh, I was uh, to avoid was... any background noise. Hi. Uh, yeah, I think it was January. No, maybe February. It was the first one of the year. Excellent. I see you've got a nice background there. That's um, a place that I went to over Christmas. That's uh, Uluru is the indigenous name for this amazing rock in the center of the continent. And I went there just for the first time over Christmas. It was incredible. And that's also from Uluru, from uh, around the corner from Uluru. What's the Karachuta, the, the other rock formation? Forget the. Oh, I haven't been, unfortunately. It's, it seems a little uh, dishonest, actually, to have it as my background. It really so. does seem disingenuous. Um, <laughs> well, not a great way to start your talk. <laughs> He's a liar. Uh, anyway, I'm going to hand it over to Aaron. Uh, he gave this fabulous talk earlier this year, and I'm glad that he gets to repraise the talk again and get some mileage out of it. And now that the good place is over, you have even more to talk about. So I'm going to hand it over to you, wishing all of you in North America the very best throughout this. And uh, hopefully, we'll see you guys again at the next one. Aaron, over to you. Good luck. Thanks, Wade. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. It's um, it's really exciting to be talking at this uh, Nerd Nightathon. Um, I really love Nerd Night, so I love that we found a way to make it happen. Um, uh, also, with all that's going on at the moment, sharing knowledge is really important. Um, and so, thanks to Chris and Matt and all, all the Nerd Night crew for inviting me uh, and for making this happen. Uh, thanks, particularly to those of you who are watching it right now. Uh, as Wade said, it's lunchtime here in Australia. Uh, but it sounds like it's kind of past bedtime for those of you on the East Coast. Uh, so thanks for staying up late uh, to watch uh, us uh, from down under. Um, more than that, with all that's going on at the moment, um, it's really easy to be overwhelmed by a sort of feeling of inertia um, or despair. Uh, so, And it's really tempting to just want to hide under the covers with a tub of ice cream and maybe sink into oblivion. So thanks for pulling yourselves out of bed, uh, turning off Netflix and listening to people talk about what they love. Um, at the moment, it's kind of all about the small victories. Uh, so it gives me a lot of hope to see all of you guys uh, joining in. So uh, as I said before, I'm Aaron. Um, I'm in Australia, not here. Uh, ooh, where's my hand going? Um, I'm in Melbourne, um, but Australia nonetheless. Uh, and tonight I'm going to be talking to you about the philosophy of the good place. Now, I know that when you think of nerds, you probably think of science or technology, uh, whereas I'm what you might call a philosophy nerd. We still wear glasses, uh, but instead of inventing cool things or curing diseases, we just bore people at parties uh, or back when we used to have parties. Uh, but no, philosophy is really important. Um, and thankfully, a number of universities still teach it. Um, I hope that at one point or another, um, some of you had a chance to engage with a bit of philosophy uh, but for those of you who haven't, don't be afraid. Um, it's actually easier than you think. Uh, so quickly before I get started, a little bit about me. Um, I just finished my PhD in philosophy. Um, and without boring you with the full 106,000 words of my thesis, uh, suffice it to say, I bring science and uh, philosophy together uh, into a sort of blueprint for how people can think and act in a way that is environmentally sustainable. Uh, now, for your sake and for my sake, uh, I'm not here to talk about my PhD. I'm actually here to talk to you about what I do when I'm not writing philosophy. I watch TV. Uh, and one show that I'm actually catching up, up on at the moment, catching up on at the moment is The Good Place. Let me see if I can share my screen. Uh, is The Good Place. Now, I expect that no one uh, came here tonight specifically to listen to me. Um, so I'm going to assume that some of you have seen it, some of you have not. Um, but you don't need to have seen the show uh, to follow my presentation um, because it's actually really um, quite a simple premise, uh, which I'm going to go through now. 
So enter the good place. It's a sort of non-denominational afterlife. It's not strictly heaven. It's kind of just um, a next phase of your existence in the universe. Um, the show predominantly focuses on six characters. Michael, the architect of the neighborhood in which the uh, show is set. Uh, Janet, a butler-like being. Uh, still not sure on that one. Uh, and then there's the four humans. Um, Tahani, a wealthy socialite. Uh, Jason, either a monk or a DJ from Florida, depending on where which season you're up to in the show. Uh, then there's Chidi, a professor of moral philosophy, hint. Um, and then Eleanor, who is the main character of the show. Now the show focuses on Eleanor because although she wakes up in the good place, she knows that she's not supposed to be there. Uh, and through ongoing hilarious flashbacks to her life on Earth, we learn that she was actually a really terrible person. Now I say terrible, um, it's not like she was Thanos or anything. She was just really selfish um, and conniving and inconsiderate. Less of a supervillain um, and more of just a Carol Baskin kind of type. Either way, she does not deserve to be in the good place. And it's her trying to not get caught uh, and trying to be a, bit, a better person that fuels much of the show. Um, so thinking about the basic premise, we can actually already see some really profound uh, philosophical ideas. The first one is metaphysics. Now, metaphysics is one of the five disciplines that constitutes modern philosophy. Uh, the other ones being um, ethics, aesthetics, and epistemology, and logic, and logic, of course. Um, now, metaphysics itself was coined by Greek philosopher Aristotle. Uh, Aristotle defines the goal of metaphysics as the science which takes up the theory of being as being and what to be means. So in other words, metaphysics is the study of what is everything. And you probably all engaged in metaphysics before without even knowing it. Metaphysics is when you're really high and you're asking your friends amazing questions like, what is the universe? What am I? What's the meaning of life? That's metaphysics. Now the show does an excellent job of discussing metaphysics. Um, they discuss the meaning of life, uh, what happens after death, and the whole show is a sort of contemplation on the idea of mortality or at least uh, how the fear of retribution, retribution frames how we live our life. Um, now, my favorite metaphysical concept on the show is this idea they invent called Jeremy Theremy. It's the idea that time is not linear. It doesn't have a start or an end, but kind of just loops around and twists and turns uh, and moves at different rates. And when you see these loops from above, it kind of spells out Jeremy Theremy uh, in cursive handwriting. Now, this is actually quite educational because it presents a pretty good insight into how we understand time, both scientifically uh, and philosophically. From a scientific perspective, we don't really know what time is yet. For classical physics, time wasn't even a consideration. Uh, Newton maintained that any process was, in theory, reversible. So time was irrelevant. Then with thermodynamics, time becomes irreversible. Uh, and re with relativity, time was connected with space into four dimensions but we still don't know anything more about what time actually is other than that time passes and we experience it passing. This is what Jeremy Veremy does. It doesn't explain cosmological time, uh, time as it really is, but phenomenological time or uh, time as it's experienced. Now in saying this, um, the idea isn't completely subjective uh, and it still actually does meet up with the science. So in classical physics, the vacuum, which makes up most of the universe, um, is empty and flat for a, a better description. Um, but for quantum physics, the vacuum is actually a noisy sea of random quantum fluctuations, uh, like this awesome GIF uh, on your screen. So if time constitutes space and much of space is a vacuum, then time is always moving and jumping around. Uh, and someone's experience of navigating this wild jumping of space and time uh, because of these quantum field fluctuations could be depicted by what we see in Jeremy Perry. Now, I should note that this is actually a really uh, painfully oversimplified version of this aspect of quantum theory. Uh, I'm sure if there are any quantum theorists at home in their pajamas watching this, they're probably squirming on the couch with their right now. Um, so please provide for your explanation and look to quantum field theory and the work of David Bohm. Aaron, I'm just going to um, just pause you for half a second because your audio is going yeah. like crazy here. Um, we're just going to just slow down for a moment and see, just talk to me a little bit. What's the best yeah, thing? Yeah, sure. I've got some headphones that I can probably plug in. No, it sounds like we are all cleared up. Uh, 
Yeah, it was possibly the graphic that was behind there. So I think we're good to go. Sorry for the interruption. Let's continue on. No, okay. uh, if it continues, I'm going to interrupt you again. But uh, let's cross our fingers and hope to die. Okay, thanks. Hope not to die. Okay. <laughs> so where was I up to? Ah, so um, aside from physics telling us that time and space are always jumping around, um, the uh, next thing about Jeremy Baramy is that it's a loop, as you can see in the picture. Now, this doesn't meet up with our experience of time, which is uh, unidirectional and linear. For example, uh, now um, my delicious Australian beer um, is full. Now it's a little bit more empty. So time is a straight line. Um, but I'm just one person. If we take an ecological perspective and shift from single organisms, me, uh, to groups of organisms, and in fact, to entire systems, we see that time is cyclical. I drink the beer, and then I die, <laughs> hopefully not immediately. Uh, then my body is buried, um, it's decomposed by microorganisms such as yeast, which goes into making beer, which is then drank by another person. So ecologically, time is cyclical. Um, and so this idea of Jeremy Baramy, although it looks ridiculous, actually goes a long way to teach us about time from both a scientific and from a philosophical perspective. Uh, but really a different branch of philosophy is the focus of the show, which is ethics. Uh, when Eleanor realizes that there's been a mix up and she's not supposed to be in the good place, she makes a plan to become a good enough person to stay there. How is she judged worthy of the good place? It's a point system. So on your time on earth, uh, all of your actions have a positive or a negative value, depending on how much good or bad they put into the universe. Uh, now, this is actually another really excellent piece of metaphysics, which is reflective of what's called process metaphysics, where every piece of matter in the universe is moving all the time, uh, and these movements have an impact on the matter around them and the matter around them and around them across the entire universe. It's kind of like a metaphysical butterfly effect. Um, but in the case of humans, our actions are a little bit more complicated than that of a butterfly's. Um, instead of flapping our wings, we might donate a kidney or we might steal someone's kidney. Every action either creates some good or some bad. And the magnitude of this is quantified and tallied against your overall score. The people with the highest scores go to the good place. Everyone else goes to the bad place. Now, the great thing about this show is that it doesn't set up a metaphysical God to judge humans' actions one by one, everyone is given their lot. Um, and that it's, it's the decisions that they make throughout their life that determine their moral worth. Now, philosophically, this is somewhere between Aristotle's ethics and existentialism. So Aristotle's ethics um, includes this idea of uh, eudaimonia, which is that you work your entire life to aim to be the best whatever you are that you can be. Um, in Greek society, everyone was defined by their job. And so Aristotle says that if you're a baker, you try to be the best baker. If you're a soldier, then you try to be the best soldier. Um, hell, if you're a tiger dealer, then you try to be the best Joe Exotic that you can be. But it's less about skill in the workplace, which in Greek is techne. Um, and instead, Aristotle and his mentor Plato use the Greek word episteme, which translates as a moral skill or essentially uh, how to live a good life. Um, so like any other skill, you practice moral skill. Um, it's kind of a process of aspiration and your success, according to Aristotle, is only, de only determined on your deathbed. So it kind of sets up life to be like a game of darts. Um, you, with each throw, with each action in your life, you aim at the center of the dartboard, moral good and you throw as best you can. You throw and you practice and you throw again, and you don't always hit right where you want to, but that's okay because you judge the quality of your game by telling the score at the end. If you've hit the center often enough, congratulations, you've reached Eudemonia. Now, the show blends this idea with existentialism, which is most closely associated with these two philosopher hunks, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre and Friedrich Nietzsche. So really simply, existentialism is the idea that you're born a blank slate um, with free will and with each, de each decision in your life, you create yourself. Uh, each choice you make over your life, good and bad, are written out onto your soul or your essence um, or your Tinder profile, whatever you want to call it. 
but the idea is that you make yourself. Only you are responsible for your actions and the person that you are is calculated by the sum of choices that you make. So this point system uh, in, in the good place sounds pretty good, right? You have free will and you just choose to do good stuff a lot of the time. Well, maybe not because the idea at the heart of the point system is utilitarianism. Uh, generally attributed to Jeremy Bentham, utilitarianism, roughly speaking, says that pleasure is the absence of pain. And so in this way, good and bad are simplified concepts. Good means that you make someone happy. Bad means that you cause someone pain. And the moral goodness of your actions is if the sum of the outcome results in more pleasure for more people than pain. It's the sort of argument that justifies, uh, for example, going back in time to kill Hitler as a baby. Um, uh, probably a more famous example of utilitarianism is the trolley problem where you're in control of a trolley or a tram or a train uh, which is heading towards five people um, who can't hear the train coming or were tied to the tracks by some sort of silent film villain. But why does it matter? But what does matter is that you have control of the trolley and you can divert it to a different track. Uh, but on that other track is one person. So you essentially have to choose to divert the train and choose to kill one person in order, in order to save five. So for utilitarianism, this is a morally good decision to make because the sum of the outcome is uh, more pleasure to more people. Um, now, just take a second to think for yourself. Could you bring yourself to kill a person in order to save five others? It's a hard choice, which is why existentialism is an important uh, or an interesting field. Now, I won't go too much into the morality of the trolley problem right now because the show does a much better job than I could. But suffice it to say, for utilitarianism um, and in the point system, the value of your actions is judged on the quantity of pleasure or pain that they cause. Lots of pleasure and only a little pain, gold star. Uh, more pain than pleasure, you're a bad person. Now, the source of much of the philosophy in the show is the Cheedy character, who, as I said, is a professor of moral philosophy. He's a self-described Kantian, which means he subscribes to the philosophy of deontology. Now, deontology is based on the work of Immanuel Kant. I'm pretty sure it's Kant, it's German. Anyway, Kant's approach is more principled, um, and he defines what he calls the categorical imperative, uh, which is essentially a set of rules for living virtuously. These imperatives are universal, uh, and so everyone has to do them all the time, no exception. It's a rejection of utilitarianism's negotiating of morality uh, and instead just says, don't do bad. Don't lie, don't kill, just no bad stuff, like at all, no matter the cause. This means no killing baby Hitler and you can't even lie even if telling the truth would uh, make someone sad. So both philosophies leave you in a bit of a pickle because while they say you should do good, the good that they suggest kind of feels a little bit bad. And so this is where we get to the big twist. Um, now, once again, um, I think some of you might have seen the show, some of you might not have seen the show. So if you haven't seen the show, um, cover your eyes or your ears. Okay, so the big twist is, are your ears covered? Okay, the big twist is, they're not in the good place, they're actually in the bad place. Oh, that's glitchy. Um, Michael is actually a demon, I'm just gonna stop that. Um, and instead of torturing the four humans the old-fashioned way with, I don't know, hot pokers and um, spiders and stuff, he figured out that the best torture is actually to stick a bunch of people together in a room and make them get along. So this is also an idea pulled from the Annals of Philosophy from a play by Jean-Paul Sartre called No Exit. Um, now... In the play, there's a famous line where the character Garcin says, um, there's no need for red hot, red hot pokers. Hell is other people. Hell is other people. Anyone who's ever had to sit through a family Christmas uh, can probably relate to this. Um, now, the thing is though, Michael's plan doesn't actually work. Instead of torturing each other, uh, the four humans help each other. Instead of bringing all their problems and selfishness, they become better people by learning philosophy. Uh, and so as they improve themselves and each other, they try to understand a little bit more about the metaphysical point system for determining good and bad. Uh, and as they try to figure out how to get into the good place, they realize that no one has gotten into the good place in 500 years. It turns out that good 
actually isn't that easy to achieve. Um, and as I said before, you might be acting morally good, but your actions might have bad outcomes. Taking the categorical imperative that I mentioned before as an example, I might tell my wife that those genes make her look fat. Uh, and so I'm acting virtuously, um, but <laughs> then she will be sad and probably throw something at me. Uh, and so I've caused her pain. In the point system, I have lost points. The counter to this is that I lie to my wife. She's not sad, but then she walks around in ugly jeans. I have then lied, I have caused her harm, and so I lose points. In both scenarios, I lose points and I go to the bad place. Um, for the record, I should say that my wife is actually really sexy and looks great in all jeans, just to clarify. So the point of the show then may not be to show the strengths of moral philosophy, but the weaknesses to show that life is maybe a little too complex to be easily designated perfectly good or perfectly bad. And of this, uh, Eleanor says, there should be a medium place because life is complex. Actions have infinite consequences, both good and bad. Uh, and these are the issues that the good place discusses through philosophy. Uh, and so what is the show trying to teach them? Is it that hell isn't other people? Um, or is it that existentialism has it right and that life is meaningless and we should just kick up our feet? Does it support utilitarianism? That it's okay to kill baby Hitler? Or uh, deontology, that you shouldn't kill anyone, especially baby Hitler? I don't think it's any of these. I think the point of the show is not to give you answers, but to make you ask questions. Questions like, how should we treat each other? What does it mean to live a good life? Not what is good, but why should we do good? So that's my takeaway from the show. Life is complex. Uh, pure good is maybe a little unattainable. Uh, and so thinking back to Aristotle's eudaimonia, the best thing we can do is to aim for our version of the good and try to be the best people that we can be uh, and just hope that there isn't actually a bad place. Thank you. Nice work, Aaron. I really enjoyed that. Uh, we had a few questions come in. Through. I, I like it even more the second time. I feel like this is something that people can watch again and um, and learn some more to really cement the concepts. Um, uh, we had some some fun back channeling there. Uh, so thanks for all your comments. Um, uh, I, I realized that you were drinking and I felt like uh, I was doing you poorly. So uh, cheers uh, yeah, for, is, for the middle of the fun. afternoon drinking in Australia on a, on a Wednesday. Um, <laughs> If you've got any more questions, pop them in there. We've got about a 10 second delay, but we'd love to hear them from you. Early on at the very beginning, there was a question that said, what starter philosophy book would you recommend? Okay, that's a good question. Um, it really depends if you've studied philosophy before. If you haven't and you're just walking into it, a really good um, philosophy book is uh, called The Consolations of Philosophy by uh, British philosopher Alain de Botton, uh, The Consolations of Philosophy. Um, it's quite a good book. It's really approachable because it sets up a whole bunch of problems that people might experience in their life. Um, and then essentially provides philosophical consolations for why it's okay to have those problems. Um, and it goes through the history and theory of philosophy to explain these. So some of the problems that Elaine uh, consoles us about is um, a consolation for not having any money, um, a consolation for being bad at sex, uh, consolation for being ugly. Um, not that necessarily these apply to everybody, uh, but uh, the theory and the history that he uses to explain the ideas um, are actually really interesting and provide a pretty good entry point for, for newcomers to philosophy. Um, I'm just wondering if you could change, uh, thanks for the comment, that was great. Can you just uh, end your presentation and then they can see us both here? Because I think that um... We probably don't need to see that full screen anymore. So if you just end the share, that'd be great. Um, I had a question that came up because you mentioned a few times in the in the uh, in your talk, you mentioned Tiger King, which I'm guessing is you being very topical. Good work on that. Uh, some good nerd night skills there. Um, <laughs> but I'm wondering if you were to do a talk on the philosophy of Tiger King, uh, what would that look like? Oh. And yes, for those of you at home, I am just setting him up for his next talk in Melbourne. <laughs> Um, that's a really good question, actually. I'm only up to episode three of Tiger King, um, so I don't know all of the um, all of the background of the show. Uh, one thing I do know is that Carol Baskin definitely killed her husband. Um, <laughs> but Allegedly, the morality 
<laughs> the morality of the show that I can see so far is um, a lot of animal ethics. Um, there's a great Australian philosophy, Australian philosopher called Peter Singer, um, who writes about Australian, uh, who writes about animal ethics. Um, he's pretty strict um, and he generally sort of is leaning towards all animals should be enshrined with rights. Um, uh, and that goes pretty far because he then sometimes is justified to say that animals should be allowed to marry uh, and the marry, their marriage should be uh, legally recognised. Um, but just generally in the sort of middle area of his philosophy, it essentially says that um, animals can feel pain, um, animals feel emotions, animals are sentient, um, and so they should be treated with respect. Um, and I think that generally applies quite well to Tiger King because although sometimes the animals are cared for quite well, uh, a lot of the time they are commercialized um, and um, in philosophy, we call it instrumentalism, where things are not seen, where living things are not seen as, seen as beings, they're seen as objects. Uh, now in instrumentalism, this often applies to people, but it can also apply to, animal, to animals as well. And so when animals are seen as instruments and not living beings, then their, um, their sentience is denied um, and they're often, uh, that becomes an excuse to mistreat them. So, um, yeah, there's definitely- That was not a question you thought you'd be answering today, I don't think, but you did a great job. And I also, um, uh, well, I mean, I, I think that now you're gonna really have to be watching those extra four episodes and thinking about this question. Yeah, they could all be redeemed, who knows? There's a couple more questions that have come up. Um, one of them is, what do you think of the point system in The Good Place? Ah, oh, that's such a good question. Um, I thought it was bad. Um, obviously the whole point of the show is to kind of say that it's bad. Um, but definitely the fact that it's based in utilitarianism um, is a pretty key indicator that it's not a sufficient moral system. Um, utilitarianism, I don't think I mentioned it in my presentation, but it was essentially written in the 18th, early 18th century um, by Jeremy Bentham. And it was a very um, imperial uh, morality. So it was definitely used to justify a lot of colonialism, um, a lot of imperialism and a lot of classism. Mm -hmm. So it left a lot of people out um, by just, uh, you know, screening over individual people and just by making them a collective um, and quantifying their, their, their pleasure or their pain, you overlook the rights of a lot of people. Uh, and so it's a really deficient system. Um, and I think that's kind of the, one of the, po the points the show makes that by reducing people and their actions to uh, quantifiable tallies, tallies, which you then can uh, make a sum of at the end, um, it, uh, yeah, it overlooks a lot of the small uh, good things that a few people do. I think we'll finish with one last excellent question here. Do you think, and there's another good question that I'm gonna point out that, um, can one learn to be more ethical person by studying philosophy? I'm gonna let that one linger. I think it's a great question. Um, but we'll end with this question. Do you think the belief in an afterlife, afterlife impacts our understanding about the importance of maintaining this earth to be habitable? Oh, that's such a topical question. I really love that. Um, and it stems from a bit of a debate at the moment um, within the general debate around climate change. There's a sort of sub debate, which um, is uh, a religious debate. Um, uh, it's happening in Australia, unfortunately, uh, should be apolitical, but a number of um, our senior politicians are using religious reasons to justify the continuing of uh, burning fossil fuels um, and essentially perpetuating climate change on religious grounds saying that, you know, it was God's decision, etc. Um, and so, yeah, there's definitely um, a bit of a problem there in uh, conflating those two things. I won't, I think we're probably running over time, so I won't go too deep into that, but yeah, it's a problematic. Thank you, for, thank you for the quick response. Thanks for an excellent talk, Matt. I'm going to hand it over to you. But first, let's just teach people, people one thing when they come to Australia to visit, when the, when the airports are opened back up and flights are permitted again. How do you say the name of the city that we live in? Me or Matt? Yes. Uh, so it's Melbourne. It's a very lazy Australian way of speaking, just like everything else that we do. But you don't, you don't uh, accentuate the on in the end. It's just Melbourne. M-E-L-B-I-N. That's the thing. If you've learned nothing else, is how to pronounce Melbourne, not Melbourne. No. No. All right, Matt. Thanks very much for having us. Thanks, Aaron. It's not Melbourne, talk. Australia. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I hear. Uh, hey, Chris, turn your Chris, or turn your thing, turn your thing back on. There you go.
Here I am. No, you've disappeared entirely into your onion rings. <laughs> um, okay, so. <laughs> Two uh, words have never been spoken. Yeah. That sounds like Chris has had one too many chum guzzlers tonight. <laughs> um, right. Uh, Aaron, Wade, thanks. Kevin, thanks. St. Petersburg, thanks. Lawrence, thanks. Madison, thanks. Orlando, thanks. Austin, thanks. North Vancouver, thanks. Um, everyone logged in. Uh, who, who's been logged in since seven o'clock? Chris Adams, you've been logged in the whole time. Are you still there? We'll find out. Hey, look, it's it's Jess and Busy. Busy, good job. All right. I don't know where my cat is. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. We got nothing else. Can we hang up? Thank you. I think so. Uh, all right. Bye. We're going to stop streaming. <laughs>